start our afternoon session and let's welcome Emmanuel Graef de Oliveira. Hello. Hello. Yes. Okay. So thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to this very nice conference. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, excited like mesons and how we can produce them both in uh, photo production and electro production. And we have an uh, interesting idea of using the holographic model to use the wave function of, uh, to get the wave function of excited states. First of all, I would like to thank, thank my collaborators, Roman, that's in Sweden, and Sheryl and uh, Hyman that are here in the conference. They have posters uh, about this work as well that you can check in the coffee break room. So this is a brief summary of what I'm going to talk. We are going to use the dipole approach to photo production, of course, as, as well as to electro production. And then we are going to have a look at these wave functions. And this is enough to produce nice uh, gamma P results, okay? But then if you want to move to nucleus target, the nuclear target, then we have to take into account shadowing. I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So basically, this is the diagram of uh, extra production. And this photo can be real or virtual. This typically will happen in electron-proton collision, okay? So it's here in uh, EIC. But we can also produce uh, the same uh, vector mesons in nucleus-nucleus uh, collision or nucleus-proton uh, collision because the nucleus has a lot of charge and this charge uh, is squared to produce the, a photon flux. And this can be studied at the LHC. And in this case, uh, the photo will be real, okay? So we will not have a hard scale from, from the, the photo. So if you look at the photo interaction with the target, when we're talking about uh, uh, photo production, uh, we take the photo, it will interact with the target, and then in the final state, we can have uh, the photon again, but we can have light vector mesons like rho, omega, and phi. And we also can have uh, heavy vector mesons like J psi. And uh, one important step is that uh, we require that uh, the target does not break. So if you start with a proton, we, we end with a proton. If it start with the nucleus, we end we end with the nucleus, okay? So these are the, the variables. We'll make, I'll show some plots uh, soon. And uh, one of the variables is the center of mass energy of the photon and proton system, okay? And uh, this is uh, W. And we'll also have the, trans uh, the transferred momentum that sometimes we will write as uh, delta. And uh, this is uh, the moment uh, the, that the proton gets. And of course, we have uh, x. It's not quite uh, Bjorken x, but the x that entered the calculation. It's the corrected Bjorken x. And uh, this will be important because we'll be probing small x or large x, depending on this variable. So if you want a small x, that's where the dipole works. We need uh, either, well, we need uh, this, this guy to be big, the center of mass big energy, and a uh, small mass here. So light, light the light vector meson will reach smaller x than the heavy me uh, vector meson. And then we can write uh, our or cross-section for gamma p going to vector meson p. Of course, it will be square of an amplitude. And uh, this is the amplitude in that pole model. 
So the basic idea here is that we start with a photon, and this photon becomes a quark and anti-quark pair. So this happens with some probability that we will call the, um, uh, sorry, some amplitude that we call the photon wave function here. And then this pair can interact with, uh, with the target. We need at least two gluons to be exchanged because uh, we want to have the proton in the final state. If there is one, one gluon, uh, then uh, there will be color here and the proton will necessarily break. So we need the two gluon exchange. And then uh, this will be related to a forward, um, forward dipole proton amplitude. That's this part. And in the end, we have to take into account that the quark and anti-quark will become the vector meson. This gives uh, another wave function here. And we will add uh, all the relevant variables. The size of the dipole is one important variable, r. We suppose that it is fixed during the dipole propagation, OK, in interaction with the proton. So the dipole is a uh, uh, good uh, degree of freedom because it does not change during the, the interaction. And we have uh, Z, that's the, sorry, we have beta, that's the momentum fraction carried by the, the quark, one minus beta by the anti-quark. And also we have a uh, impact parameter dependence here uh, in, this, in, this, in this calculation, because we want to take to, into account that uh, maybe we have uh, a distribution in T Okay, so since this is the elastic dipole amplitude, so it's the amplitude that uh, nothing happens and the dipole is in the final state as it was in the initial state, we can use the optical theorem to, to write it in terms of the inclusive dipole amplitude. That will be just one gluon exchange. So it's like we can say that we have a cut here and then we have amplitude of one interaction, amplitude of another interaction. So it's, it's the square. And then you have a cross section here in the amplitude. So we can write with this trick it as a B dependent uh, dipole cross section. And it will be twice this, 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 this N that we have here. Right, so this dipole cross sections here is integrated in B, okay, because it's easier to show. We take this plot from uh, these guys here, and there are a lot of possible dipole cross sections, okay. They more or less agree in some parts. In large R, they disagree a lot, but perhaps they disagree as well. To a smaller x, if you go to a smaller x, they also disagree at small r. So. It is interesting that the, with the light vector meson, we have uh, we can look for we can look at a larger, a bit larger R, and maybe we have some uh, some uh, opportunity to test the different dipole cross sections. Okay. So one possible model that we use uh, is the BSAT model that was fitted to HERA F2 data for the dipole cross-section model. And uh, it does have a B dependence, okay? And this B dependence comes from JPSI electric production, but most of the parameters are not fitted to, to JPSI electro production, just to F2 data, okay? It's just this, this BG that comes from JPSI electro production. And we have BCGC model as well. B means that's dependent on B, okay? And the, the same story here will be fitted to F2 data, okay? This is an uh, interpolation of BFKL and BQuake solutions, okay? So we will have saturation here uh, as well. And uh, it's the, the B dependence is also fitted to JPSI electroproduction. Then uh, we have to look at the photon wave function, but this was calculated in uh, QED. 
So it's a standard perturbation theory. Okay, the main realization was that uh, we have to take both at the same time into account to have the dipole, and then we get an easy expression. Here it's a little bit complicated, but these derivatives only really act on, the, on this Bessel function. Here we have more details because of the polarizations. We want to keep the polarization that's in the beginning towards the end. Uh, and this is what's calculated, uh, what was first put in the literature uh, almost 30, uh, more than 30 years now ago. So one question is the meson wave function, okay? Because for, for hard vector meson, we could use, um, we could use uh, uh, solve non-relativistic Schrodinger equation get the wave functions, do the Melosh rotation to, to boost it to, to the reference frame and uh, work with that, okay? But if the quartz are light, like in the vector meson, we cannot uh, use no relativistic model. So on one uh, solution was to rewrite this wave function uh, more or less like we do with the, with the, with the photon, okay? and have a uh, scalar wave function here that will be longitudinal or transversely polarized. Again, we keep the, the full polarization details here, and of course it's normalized. But uh, the important thing is that uh, if we go to, to this approach that we call, we call holographic meson wave function that's approached by Brodsky and Teramont, we can get this scalar wave function in the light front, okay, using the, the correspondence between ADS and CFT. Of course, QCD is not conformal, so it doesn't, it, it, it should be not be 100% precise, but we hope it, it gets the main ingredients, okay, and there will be one parameter that will be possible to fit. And, um, they get, uh, they get uh, another Schrodinger equation, but this Schrodinger equation is fully relativistic, okay? It's not, uh, it's, it's not non-relativistic. And then we have uh, a confining potential that will take from the, um, from the ADS side, the soft wall potential. That's what, that's what they did here. And uh, it's essentially a harmonic oscillator, okay? So with one parameter. So we have this parameter to fit uh, maybe the spectrum. We can do many things with this wave function. Here we're just interested in the, in the photo production, okay? So we have this parameter to fit and we have the solutions. Harmonic oscillator is easy to solve, okay? You have analytical solution. And uh, the question is, uh, what's gonna be kappa, right, the parameter? So for rho and omega, it's more or less okay. This is, um, this is angular momentum, this is the mass of the state. And uh, picking one uh, kappa, we can more or less have all the energies uh, to, to a good approximation, okay? But for phi, we do have a problem because uh, if we pick this, this parameter here, maybe we get a good description of this guy. But this guy is not what we are producing. We are producing only L equals zero. So maybe for us, it's better to have this guy. So we change a little bit the uh, kappa parameter to get this uh, dotted line here. And this is going, what we're going to use to have, uh, to have our uh, light vector meson wave function. And one important uh, feature of doing excited states, of course, if you have a potential, you can calculate the ground state, but also excited states as well. And if you calculate excited states, we have a node in the wave function, okay? So this, this means that uh, these wave functions will draw contributions from the dipole cross-section from different regions in R, the size of the dipole. 
So this is very interesting for us because this means we're getting more information about the dipole cross-section if uh, we study these excited states. Right, here is some corrections uh, that we can add because uh, we can use the, the quark masses, maybe not say it is zero, but say it is this uh, effective mass uh, for U and D and this larger one for, for the strange quark. Uh, and the, here the things get a little bit mixed, okay, because the previous wave function that we are using actually depends on just one varia variable, zeta. Zeta is a combination of the dipole size and the momentum fractions of the quarks. But then if you want to add quark masses, the, now this, doesn't, this does not depend only on zeta, it depends also on beta. And then uh, maybe this is one point of this, that we could improve this, uh, this wave function, this description, to have a better description that is dependent on both variables. But for now, we're just doing the, the first step, that's it, to use these distributions. We also take into account that uh, the real part of the scattering amplitude, I didn't mention before, but we are just using the imaginary part, but from dispersion relations, we get the real part or at least a good approximation for it. And also, well, in this diagram, in this diagram, these two gluons do not have exactly the same X, okay? They have different X, so this is the skewedness. Maybe one has a little bit larger X, the other one a little bit smaller. This can be taken into account uh, under certain approximations by multiplying the cross-section by this factor. It's well known in the literature. So, and then we can calculate total cross-section. So this is just repeating our amplitude here with dependency in B here or dependency in T here. But if you want to, to integrate in T, maybe instead of integrating this expression, we just integrate uh, this, this expression here, where we set t to zero, we integrate just this exponential because it's easier and uh, it works uh, relatively well. And then you have this new parameter here. So this is our first results. This is raw electroproduction, okay. Uh, we have here the BSAT, BSAT is always going to be this purple color. BCGC is uh, bluish, uh, greenish uh, color. Okay, so we have here this, this data points. The data points have very small uncertainty, so they're very precise, okay? And here we have some discrepancy between the two models, okay? This is somewhat expected. Not all models will give the same results. But overall, we have a good des description of, uh, of the data, considering we did not fit the, the dipole cross-sections to this data. Here, more or less the same thing. And then, uh, since we have electroproduction, we have virtuality of the photon, and we have all these values of the virtuality, and all these values of the virtuality as well. So it's in a quite broad range of uh, virtuality, and it is working for rho using that wave function, okay? So for photo production, then we have k squared equals zero. This is, this is a, bit, a little bit more challenging because now if in photo production, we don't have any hard scale, okay? Because the light vector meson has a mass that cannot be considered a, 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 a hard scale. The mass is smaller than the proton, okay? And uh, also now the photon has virtuality zero, so don't have hard scale here. But the dipole formalism works for lower scales. You can do GBW, for instance, fit uh, to very low Q squared scales. So this is the photo production, and we hope it would work. And uh, more or less it works, especially for BSAT in this case, 
considering that this data was not fitted, we could, have, we could say that we have good agreement with the data. And then we can do t-dependent. In t-dependent, we have uh, also, I would say, good agreement. Here in this case, uh, this is rho, rho, and then uh, dependence on t. Uh, and uh, here, I would, we did not put the BSAT model because then it was very bad. Okay. So we didn't show it, okay. But we mentioned it, it didn't work quite well in this case. Not because BSAT is a bad model, but we use it different wave function. We're using different approaches, different ideas. So maybe it has to be refitted. Uh, this is electroproduction, and then you have photoproduction as well. Then beside, uh, BSAT is reborn, and actually works better than BCGC in this case. So in photo production, the BSAT seems to be the, the best model of the two. Of course, we tried many other models as well, but uh, these are the two best that, uh, that could, uh, the, both, in, uh, both together can describe our data moral, with a good agreement, okay? And then we have omega results. Uh, this will be, in the left, we have photo production and electro production on the right, just uh, photo production. So far, I'm not talking about excited states, just the ground states, okay? And uh, here we have a lot of data, so I would say good description if you take uh, both curves into account. And then we have five results. Uh, uh, this was not, um, this was not uh, well described before by other groups, uh, or at least not this amount of data, because now there is a lot of data from, uh, from Zeus, and we were very happy that we could describe phi, that mainly we were able to do it mainly because we changed this kappa here. So this was, this, we changed because of this point, but uh, it also helped with this point here as well to change it. And then we have prediction for excited states. We don't have data points so far for them. Uh, we can do the prediction because we have the same model for excited states and ground states, so it should, uh, it should work. We don't have to refit uh, to red cover rediscover a new wave function. We just use the same wave function, sorry, the same equation to get the excited state wave function. And this is with the W dependence, uh, center of mass of gamma P uh, system or uh, T dependence as well. We, we can do more predictions if the if people are interested in, in measuring these uh, excited states. And then one thing that was very interesting that also I would say that was the, the main objective of this work was to have a look at the ratio between excited and uh, fundamental state because then you cancel many uncertainties and then you can uh, have more information about the wave functions, okay? So we are thinking, yeah, maybe you just use BCGC and show the ratio uh, between them. So this would be the blue curves here, right? And uh, we show, well, if you measure these guys, maybe we can have, we can uh, select a best wave function or have more information about the wave function. But then, uh, we decide. Well, let's let's do this plot for BSAT as well. You know, the students have to do something with the day, right? So they did very well for the BSAT, and they got this result that I didn't believe at first, okay, because it was very different. But then we we sat down and we understand that because why is so different, right? It's because of this that I mentioned before. We, we are picking very different parts of the dipole cross-section, okay? This is R, the size of the dipole. For instance, around this region here, the, the dipole cross-section does not contribute in the excited state. And here it's a large contribution, right? And here we have large contribution. 
and here we don't have almost any contribution. So it's not only that we are, we are testing the wave functions, but also the dipole cross-section models, because if you integrate everything, most of the effects disappear. But when you compare both, you are, you are, you are sensitive to the shape of the dipole cross-section. So this was very nice to, to get. And uh, this is submitted so far, all of these results. We mainly use many different theories, right? We use dipole cross-section. We use impact parameter dependence. This is somewhat related to what some people here do when they use TMD or GPD is OK. And uh, we use also uh, wave functions uh, for the mesons, that's also related to what other people here do as well. And you use CGC, that's also something that another set of people here are using. So we're using different tools from different groups, okay, to produce this prediction. So we're doing phenomenology here. Right. But then we, go, we want to go to nuclear target. Right, and then we can have coherent or incoherent. In the incoherent uh, production, you have uh, excited state here, but we'll be mostly interested in the coherent production, okay? And then we produce the, the vector mass. So this is one case of photo production for LHC, for instance. And then uh, uh, we have the coherent production, okay? So the basic idea, uh, the basic Glauber idea would be that if you have something that is going to interact with the nucleus, you have uh, many interactions with uh, each uh, nucleon, right? Okay, and then you sum over all these interactions. But then uh, Gribov added a correction that uh, you can have interactions in such a way that in the in the intermediate state, you have a diffractive state, okay? So you can have more things, not just the particle you're studying, but more different things here. So you have to take into account uh, more things here. This increases the cross-section, okay? And uh, this is what we do. We use the dipole formalism, right? That's already developed uh, by, by other people as well. So we have uh, the same idea. So. For us, it's the dipole that will travel here. It's not the photon, it's the dipole. So the photon will break into dipole, and then the dipole will interact multiple times with the nucleus, and then the dipole will become a vector meso in the end. So we, we have to sum over all the dipoles propagating in the nucleus. If the nucleus is large, we can use this one minus exponential to, to describe the multiple interactions. And uh, each, actually each amplitude, right, is one dipole uh, cross-section. And then we need uh, to describe uh, how the, the nucleons uh, form the nucleus. So we use wood saxon that's pretty standard uh, distribution, right? And the fact that uh, we have now multiple interactions with the target means that we will have a little bit smaller cross-section, okay? If you had uh, just one interaction, we would expand this exponential. It will be one minus this guy, and then we put it here, and then we have just one profile. But now we have uh, higher order terms in the exponential, the argument squared, the cube, et cetera. So, the cross-section will get smaller. This is what will be called uh, quark shadowing. So shadowing is the idea that uh, one of nucleon is in front of the other, so it's making a shadow in the, the one behind. So the photon does interact uh, with both in the same way it would interact with both if they were put apart. It's not, not just twice the interaction, it's a little bit smaller than twice. Okay, so we do that with uh, different models here, including a BK solution uh, for the nucleus. And uh, 
we have one data point. This is the case of raw. So it's nuclear photo production. And uh, we don't get quite there, OK? So it doesn't work. We cannot publish. The student doesn't finish the PhD. It's not good. So we have to work more here, maybe include more things. So just Glauber Gribov is not good enough if done this way, OK? If done this way. So even if you don't use Glauber Gribov, VKA does not have Glauber Gribov, we also don't get a good result. So what's the idea? The idea is to maybe take into account higher fluctuations. So the photon becomes quark and anti-quark, OK. But the quark can emit a glue. Now we have three particles that we interact with the target. And then we have many ways these things can interact, of course. This would be related to uh, next leading order calculation, OK? Uh, this uh, one of the first the first guys, uh, well, many people talked about this, but uh, this figure is from from this reference. And now, from now on, we follow more or less what Kopelovich and collaborators have been doing. And uh, okay, if uh, if you are doing proton, we are taking into account all of this effectively because we are fitting the dipole cross section to the to the gamma p scattering, OK, result, right? So these are taken to account in a kind of effective way, right? Right. Uh, when this, when this uh, happens, it happens, this approach of dipole uh, uh, assumes that the lifetime of the fluctuation, right, is large, infinite, actually, infinite. So, but uh, in practical terms, we want the, the length that this fluctuation exists, exists to be larger than the target. And now you have proton target, OK, so it's small, but now having nucleus target, that's much larger. So maybe these fluctuations that were included in the proton case will not survive for the whole extension of the nucleus. So maybe they will die inside here, or they will start here. You have to take into account this. So Kopelovich and Emchik provided this table of the coherence length of the quark and anti-quark, uh, plus gloom, plus two glooms, etc. cetera. Uh, they did for JPSI, OK, not for like vector mesons, OK? And uh, then you see, for quark and anti-quark, OK, this is much larger than the nucleus and the proton. This is not much larger than the nucleus. It's, of course, much larger than the proton. And these other ones start to get smaller and smaller. Maybe they are, they are uh, small, even for the proton. So what they argue is this was included in proton and nucleus. These two gluons or more are not included in any the proton, uh, in either the proton or the nucleus. But this one is the key one. This has been included in the proton, so it gives an up in the cross section, but it will not be 100% present in the nucleus. So in the nucleus, we have to have a little bit more shadowing to take into account that this guy does not survive all the time inside there. Yeah. And uh, also, they, they, they say that, that, OK, OK, it's not me. They say that uh, the balitz koshakov equation cannot be applied to nucleus just because of this problem, because balitz koshakov equation will take into account an evolution that will take uh, into account uh, uh, all these Fox states, uh, infinite number of gluons, etc. So. We did that for JPSI in another paper, OK? So this is just a parenthesis. To, it works if, you're not, if you add gluon shadowing, but we did not calculate gluon shadowing. We used the gluon shadowing for EPPS 16 that some set of people here in this conference also work with. And it works. So we had quark shadowing and gluon shadowing, two shadows here. And it worked quite well for, for, 
uh, J psi. So the, the red line means no gluon shadowing, just quark shadowing. The black line means we add gluon shadowing. And then it works more or less with the, well, at least LHCB data. And uh, here in this case with uh, CMS and ALICE data for J psi. But remember that we're interested in uh, light vector mesons that are light vector mesons have a much lower scale. And uh, of course, this EPPS will not, uh, uh, will not uh, reach very low scales because they use big lap evolution. Big lap evolution only works for large Q squared compared to the light vector meson. So we cannot just plug in some gluon shadowing from some nuclear PDF, okay? Uh, okay, but these guys, uh, Nemchik uh, and Krelina, uh, calculated in the dipole formalism the, the gluon shadowing, okay? But since they did a calculation, only take into account of this guy here. And then it only works if Q squared is not very, more or less medium, okay? A little bit large, okay? So if you want to go to, to the light ve vector meson, we need maybe include this one, this one, and then the calculation becomes very complicated, okay? And they didn't do it. So we don't, they don't help us also with uh, the gluon shadowing, okay? Because they consider just this fluctuation. But we still want to go to these smaller scales to, to calculate uh, light, light vector mesons. So we have to find a solution to this problem. And our solution is, well, wait a second. There is data for the small scales. Uh, EPPS and uh, Nemchik and Krelina don't use this data, but there is such data for the small scales, okay? Uh, well, at least we hope there, there was, right, some uh, smaller scale data. Oh, uh, and since you use the dipole cross-section, it is valid for the small scales, right? Maybe you can extract the shadowing factor from any available data, okay? And if you are going to calculate this in the color dipole approach, right, uh, the number of gluons does not matter, right? If you're extracting for, from data, if you're calculating, it matters. So if you're calculating, it matters. You have to take into account all of them is difficult. But if you're just extracting it from data, the number of gluons doesn't matter. So we can go from, to, from JPSI to, to Rho, for instance. Rho will have um, longer coherence coherence length, so this is important, this is important, but it does not enter the calculation if you do it effectively. And that's what uh, we are doing. Actually, we are trying to finish during the conference, and uh, we have to integrate this. Uh, we have this expression. If you, if you get Ra, that's the, the ratio of F2, right, from nucleus and proton, if you have this, uh, this will be the gluon shadow minus some number of times the gluon shadow squared. This number is a bit complicated to, to calculate, but we are, we, are, we are getting better and better at calculating it. We can see that uh, it has photon wave function, uh, uh, quark and anti-quark uh, uh, momentum fraction, dipole cross-section, everything said before. But there is also green functions. Green functions is another thing that another set of people in this conference does, right? So this green function, well, we use a very poor model for it, okay? Just very simple harmonic oscillator as well, like Nemchik and Krelina did. So we just apply the same model that they use. And uh, this green function is, uh, can be represented pictorically here. That means that we have the propagation of the quark and then the anti-quark from one interaction to another interaction point. That's why you have the shadow squared here. And uh, this is fitted to, to many data. A harmonic oscillator has just one parameter and so it's fitted uh, to, to all this, this kind of data. It works uh, more or less well. And then we can have one 
result if we have a data point, right? Because we need to put the data point here and we calculate H and then we will find the glue shadowing. And uh, we, we were lucky. This data point here from uh, the Fermilab uh, collaboration is more or less the key squared for our light, light vector mesons and also the X that we want. So we just took this data point and plug it in there. Of course, we had to search in many papers and see if they had a data point, but we are lucky to find this one here. And then we could produce this nice plot with a whole nuclear photoproduction with gluon shadowing. And this is preliminary results because we do, not, we do not trust our calculation in H, okay? So I'm almost 100% almost, uh, sure that there is a mistake in the calculation, okay? But I'm hoping that there is at least two mistakes, so maybe one cancel another, because we got very good description here of the data, right? The, our curves are getting, are passing through the error bars at two different energies, and maybe even when we change the, the rapidity, we get a little bit different X, but we, we are getting good result. So maybe next month we'll be sure, hope these curves don't, do not move too much, and then we, we can publish this result for raw nuclear photoproduction, and also add Phi and, uh, and the, other, the other guys. Okay, so this is my conclusion. Uh, light vector meson is is good process to study small scales, okay? Uh, we can describe the gamma p case very well with the dipole model. The ratio of excited state to ground state will give us more information, both about the wave function and the dipole cross-section. And in the nuclear target case, the shadow is necessary, but we were able to get this shadowing effectively fit into data, right? And uh, it looks, it works as well. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Questions? Emmanuel, I was just uh, curious about, uh, you mentioned about the higher fourth states contribution. Yes, here. I couldn't get, well, how uh, those uh, uh, wave functions or contributions to the, the wave function come from and how do you include it in the calculation? Right, yes, if, uh, uh, well, this is, this is the standard one, that's the one I showed. If you want to do this one, uh, it's uh, pretty complicated. That's why what uh, this uh, Nemchik and Krelina did. So you have to work a little bit to, to get uh, this contribution because now we have two dipoles uh, and you have to do some approximations and some calculations, another wave function, uh, important. Actually, they, they say that they have heavy quarks so they say that they have just one dipole, that they have the heavy quark pair and the gluon here, and that's the size of the dipole. So they say this, they are very close. Quark and anti-quark are very close and gluon is far away. So they, they fall back to a single dipole scheme as well. They do a lot of approximations, okay? But our idea is not doing that. And this is, I don't know anyone who has calculated or has any idea how to calculate this this uh, two gluing state because this would be next to next to leading order if you do it properly, okay? And uh, but as I know that uh, dipole approach is reaching next leading order now. So what, we didn't do any of that. We just, uh, because in this calculation here, in this H, it, all of these diagrams do not enter. We just have the propagation of the, the quark and anti-quark pair. So this is, this is uh, one uh, that, that was possible to calculate. And then we don't have to say 
this is big, this is not so big, this is small. No, we are taking into account all of them, but uh, actually are fit into experiment. <laughs> Hi, thanks for a nice talk. You know your <laughs> results, the dependence of the model for vector me meson function. Here? Me meson wave function, the dependence of the results. You know you have some feeling about that. Well, that you as the SKCD, that right? Yes, yes, yes. Well, in this paper we try to show, well, the, uh, we can calculate this, and we have this prediction to use this set of the wave functions. So maybe if somebody measures it, then we will put data point here, there. Then it will be much more interesting to, to use different wave functions, and maybe some uh, not uh, calculated from uh, first principles, but just, uh, just try some shapes and uh, see what works best. But uh, this, would, I would say, it would be a, a follow-up follow work. Yes, yes, yes. We just try to show it's possible. It works for what we have, and we have this prediction. Very silly question, but how did you get that QR code that goes to the archive? That's pretty cool. Sorry? How did you get that QR code that's to the archive? That's well, that's cool. uh, thanks to Cheryl. Maybe Cheryl can answer that. How do you get the QR code? Yes. Probably an app as well, right? Yes, there's a right. site on Google. Google can create, so it's free. Yeah. Yes, it creates the QR code. <laughs> okay, I don't see any other raised hands. So thank you again, Emmanuel. Thank you. So we have our next speaker. Okay. Test done. Um, and thank you for accommodating the change of schedule. It's because I had a problem, so I'm glad that you were able to accommodate and, and, and still give me the opportunity to talk a little bit here. So the title of the talk is a little long. It's Extreme Collaboration, a full hybrid uh, model to simulate high energy heavy ion nuclear collisions. I, I have to read it because it's too long anyway. Uh, I, I'm, I'm here representing a collaboration of people called the Extreme Collaboration. I'll just talk about it. Uh, uh, what is the Extreme Collaboration? So the Extreme Collaboration is a collaboration uh, that we built here in Brazil. It's called the, let me read it again, the Experiment and the Theory in the Extreme Matter Collaboration. It's a group of uh, people focused on phenomenology of high energy heavy ion collisions with a special interest in connecting theory with experiments. So this, this, this was an idea that came up when we were preparing a grant proposal for a Brazilian funding agency, the Sao Paulo funding agency, that when we studied, when we worked in heavy ion collisions, there was already a community here in Brazil, which is very typical, and it's also the same thing for the EIC, that we have a community of theorists working here. And then some of us, I'm an experimentalist, 
started working on the experiment in heavy ion physics. So we, we felt the need to put these two communities together. I remember from my, my young days when I worked at the Brookhaven and, and it was a very productive uh, partnership between the theory group in Brookhaven and the, the, the experiments, the star hallway, the Phoenix hallway, and the, the, and the, and the theory hallway. So we, we wanted to, to, to copy that and have the same thing. So we, we, we organized this, this project, this grant proposal to uh, put together theorists and experimentalists. And that's what we did. This is a list of the extreme collaboration uh, where we have people from many institutions, myself and David, we are the experimentalists in this group. And then we have within the, our, the same institution, a theorist, Giorgio, who everybody knows, uh, uh, he's common in every field in physics, right? So it's, it's the same Giorgio in every field. But then we have people at USP and, and, and Rio de Janeiro, uh, Federal Fluminense and Santa Catarina from where Emmanuel just came, Thiago from, from, from Santa Catarina. And also George, George used to be with us at Sao Paulo, but now he's at uh, Urbana Champaign. Uh, so this is the extreme collaboration. And I'll be showing you some results of what we did with this collaboration, how fruitful and successful it was to put together the theorists and experimentalists. But one of the main uh, results that I want to emphasize is that not only we created this collaboration and we got results from it, but we were also, one of the most important results that we get from this collaboration is the creation of new collaborations. So I will also show you the results of a second collaboration that came out of the extreme collaboration. It's called the 3C collaboration, which is us again from Unicamp together with Mike, Mike Lisa. Some of us uh, know Mike very well. He's been here to Campina several times already. It's good old friend of mine from, from the Brookhaven days from Ohio State and Wayne State University where Shun Chen. So this is the second collaboration that started because of the extreme collaboration. I, I consider that one of the success results of building this collaboration. So what is uh, uh, the, the collaboration? Obviously, we start with the most important part of the collaboration, which is the experiment, right? I'm an experimentalist, so for me, that's the most important part of physics, the experiment. And now we go to the most beautiful experiment in heavy ion collisions at the LHC which is the Alice experiment, which is a, I'm a member of. Everybody knows, but maybe some, some people don't because we are not in heavy ion physics community here. It's a large experiment uh, built to measure simultaneously several, several uh, uh, information from, from, from that we look. We look for heavy ion collisions. And what we do here is that we have a set of several different uh, uh, top of state of the art detectors that measure the most information you can from all the particles, right? The problem with heavy ion uh, collisions is that it's a messy business, right? Very different from EIC. What we have is tons of particles being produced in one single event, and we have to make sense out of this. So it's messy, it's, it's complicated, but we can make sense out of this. The good thing is that we have a lot of data, so we have a large amount of data. So looking closely to what actually happens in a heavy ion collision, so you have two heavy nuclei colliding, right? And eventually the system uh, uh, excites the, the QCD vacuum. You have a, a system formed, a very hot system formed in extreme condition, hence our name, extreme collaboration. So you have a system that is formed in a very high temperature, uh, low net baryon density, Right? And eventually you hope, or you, you, we know nowadays that we form this, what we call quark gluon plasma, where you have color degrees of freedom in the quark gluon plasma. This quark gluon plasma eventually evolves, and we want to understand what happens here, exactly what happens here. The problem that we have is that this is not what we measure, right? This is what we want to understand. This is what, you know, we are, what we are interested in. But what we actually measure is something like this, which is actually a, a real event from the Alice experiment. So every single line here that you see is a charged particle measured by our TPC detector, 
right? So you take every single line here, it's a, it's a particle, it's a charged particle, and you have to make sense out of this to try to understand what was here. So to do that, that is the work of putting together an extreme collaboration. That's what we do, right? So nowadays we understand very well, or we can separate our problems in different stages. We understand that this is what happens in heavy ion collisions. You can separate nicely uh, 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 to explain the, the different phases of the collision. So you have an initial early stage where the particles interact, right? And this is where you're hitting the vacuum. Eventually this system evolves, right, achieving some kind of local equilibration, and then you have uh, the conditions necessary for what we call the hydrodynamic evolution. So we can apply effective hydrodynamic theory to describe what the, this heated extreme matter, uh, how, how it be, behaves, right? Eventually, the system is very explosive, has a lot of pressure, so this thing explodes, evolves, and it cools down. It goes down to a point where you go through the phase transition again, back into normal matter, back into hadronic matter. So we go through what we call particleization. Right? Once these particles, uh, they, they form hadrons, they, they are still hot, very hot. Uh, uh, so they still interact among them. And so we, we have to also understand what happens after particleization. So you have a hot hadronic gas that interacts. So to understand what happens in a heavy ion collisions, we need to understand every single step of this diagram. So that's what we do in the extreme collaboration. We put together all these different stages. Let me just add two more boxes to this, this line. So we have the early stage that we saw. Uh, I'm gonna put in an extra box called the pre-equilibrium phase. And then we have the hydrodynamic evolution, particleization, and hadron gas, just like I showed in the previous uh, uh, scheme. And then let me add another box here, which is the experimental observable. This is what actually we observe, what the experiments observe. So we have to go through the, this entire chain to connect the experimental observable to the different physics in every single step of a heavy ion collision. That is the goal of the extreme collaboration. To do that, we put together and we try to understand the physics of every each one of these boxes. The early stages, we use uh, uh, an event by event initial condition generator, different initial condition generators that has different physics into them, right? After that, we do a pre-equilibrium dynamics. You can do free streaming or effective uh, kinetic theory to describe what happens with the system that you created in the initial condition. Eventually, you achieve the conditions to hydro, hydrodynamic evolution, and then we solve the, uh, this, this system. We, we evolve the system using hydrodynamic models, uh, and effective hydrodynamic models that basically uses uh, uh, en energy conservations and some transport coefficients and, and, and some, some uh, equation of state. As I said, uh, the, the system evolves, achieves particleization, it cools down, and you form particles. Uh, together, right? So we have uh, this thermal production of hadrons on, on this freeze-out hypersurface from the hydrodynamic evolution. Once these particles are created, they still interact, so you have to do some hadronic cascading. So we simulate the hadronic cascading after particleization. And all, after all that, you have these particles produced on an event-by-event -event basis, and then you put them in a format that the experiments can analyze. And that's what we do the entire chain. Do we really need to do all this, all these different uh, stages to understand what happens in a heavy ion collision? And the answer is yes. We showed back in 2009, this is another collaboration, the next ferry collaboration also from Sao Paulo and Rio. We showed back in 2009 that some of the details that we observe Heavy ion collisions are very dependent on these boxes, right? This is a, 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 a very old uh, result that we had where you have, the, it was one of the first times that we used a full-blown simulation with a fluctuating initial condition. Back then, nobody used to do fluctuating initial condition. And, and by doing this fluctuating initial condition, we were able to reproduce a measurement that the STAR experiment, a heavy ion experiment that Rick in Brookhaven had. It was a big mystery back then, the famous ridge. Some of us might have heard of this ridge structure. And we showed this is simulation. This is uh, uh, the data from the STAR experiment. 
and you see that, that that's pretty much the same. And the origin of this ridge that we showed in this paper here was due to the fluctuation. If you take the fluctuations out, this ridge goes away, right? So it, it showed us how important it is to have all the different steps. And even though we have a hydrodynamic evolution, the fluctuations in the early stages would survive the hydrodynamic evolution and, and be able to be uh, measured in, as an experiment observable. So it showed us that it was important. Since then, it has become more and more important to have a full blown simulation, right? Because we have now large amounts of data different collision systems and different energies, new experimental observables to be tested, higher order VNs, the, 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 the particle correlation measurements that we do, better precision measurements. So if you want to compare uh, uh, some physics model to our data, we have a lot of precision measurements, so you need to have a full-blown simulation now. So it has become more and more necessary to have a complete simulation chain like the one we have. What we did actually in reality is to take this and, and, and we picked uh, from the market the best model, the state of the art model, or the ones that are most used and tested by the community. And we put it together. So the early stage, we use codes like Trento that everybody in our community uses. Pre-equilibrium, there was a, a code called Compost that does the effective uh, kinetic theory evolution of the system. And then hydrodynamic evolution, we have many uh, codes in the market. <coughs> Sorry. The most used one is uh, music. It's the one that we use. Particleization is a, is a sampling code that creates particles out of uh, the hypersurface of the hydrodynamic evolution. Hadron gas, we use URQMD, which is very much used from the community. And then we put everything in a format. It's called Hadrex format which is a format in root, which is the one that we used in the ALICE experiment. So we can actually use some of the analysis codes that we use in the Alex experiment in our data created by this simulation chain. That's the, the, the whole, whole point. This entire chain uh, must be connected. It's not a simple task because you, you gotta make sure that every step, uh, uh, that there is consistency between what one, one box spits out and what the other box needs, you, you, sometimes you, you need to write some, some uh, connection code and all that. And obviously you need state-of-the-art computational power to generate event-by-event -event, uh, uh, simulation. So that is the key advantage of our, our chain is that you can do on an event-by-event -event basis. Uh, once you, you put together all this code, you have to configure the chain. A lot of people do that. There are other chains in the market, not as beautiful and nice as ours, but there are other, other chains, similar chains to ours. Uh, and so what we do is like them, you, you have to compare all these different knobs, different variables that you have in your model, like the equation of state or the time between every steps and so on with the experimental data. So obviously you can change these knobs, these variables to fit the experimental data. As a starting point, we used uh, uh, the, the, the variables that were fitted by other groups. We tested all of them, like the Duke group, Jetscape and Trajectum. So the, the, these people have much more computational power than we do. They don't have a beautiful chain like we do, but, but they have much more comp uh, a bigger computational power. So they could actually do, for instance, uh, a Bayesian analysis to fit all those parameters with uh, several experimental data. And so they, they generated an initial set of parameters for us. And that's what we used. Uh, and like I said, these, the, the, the chains from these other groups, they all have differences between each other. Some of them have uh, you know, different approaches to the equation of state or, or this or that. Uh, uh, ours is one of the, uh, the few ones that has actually a pre-equilibrium phase inserted into the chain. So once you have all this, uh, we, we actually tested the, the configuration. So this is one observable it's called VN, V2 v3 and v4 so this is a correlation uh, uh, parameter among the particles uh, uh, as a correlation uh, and uh, 
So you, you, you can see in different colors here is the results from our chain by using the parameters from the, 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 the other groups, the Drew, Duke and the, the Dutch group, the trajectomy is a Dutch group. So you can see that it all agrees very well with the experimental data that is here, the other data that is in, in gray here. So our chain works, we, we tested it, it works, it gives the same results as the, the other chains, right? Uh, all these, uh, even though these, the, the experimental data that are fitted are, are, are equal, they all equally fit the experimental data, you can see that the, the parameters used in the chains are very different. So this is like a shear viscosity is the transport coefficient of the hydrodynamic evolution part. And these are the, the, the different curves that the different models from the different groups used. You can see that they vary a lot. The bulk, bulk viscosity varies a lot between the different models. So even though the result, the experimental result is the same, meaning they, they can describe the experimental data, the actual physics that they put into every, every chain is, is, is very different. So that, that, that is an important point here. Uh, so once you, you do that, you, you start uh, fitting the data. We also fit the, our data. So this is uh, the first thing that you look at to see if your code is working is you look at the number of particles produced, the, the charged particle multiplicity. So this is the charged particle multiplicity of Alice and, uh, and the charged particle multiplicity as a function of what we call centrality the, is, is how uh, uh, the collision, the, the, the heavy ion nuclei are aligned when they collide. We call it very central when they are aligned, the impact parameter is zero or very peripheral when they are not aligned, so you produce less particles, right? So you can compare the multiplicity distribution of the experiment with our code, and you see a very nice agreement. Actually, this is a parameter, a free parameter, an empirical parameter in, in the chain, in every chain of this type. So we set, we have uh, configured our chain, and now you can start looking at what you get out of it. The, the second thing that you look at is the PT spectra and what we call flow observables, VN, again, this correlation between particles and some new stuff like polarization. So that's what we did. That's what the extreme coloration did is that we, we started looking at these things and try to understand, for instance, the effect of each of one of these boxes into the final observable. What happens if I change the knob here? If I put this thing in or out, how important is the pre-equilibrium phase to the final observable? So we, we have a toy, a very nice toy where you can turn things on and off. You can change the equation of state here, or you can change the transport coefficient, the viscosity in particular here to see how it affects your final result here. So it's a very nice toy that we put together, and these are some of the results that I will be talking to you now. Um, first thing I, we, we always look is the PT distribution, the momentum distribution of the particle. This is already a result. Uh, details of these results can, can be found in these publications of the extreme collaboration here. So you can see that, for instance, I was mentioning how does the pre-equilibrium, how important is the pre-equilibrium to the final final observable, experimental observable. So this is a ratio between the spectra with pre-equilibrium and without pre-equilibrium, no pre-equilibrium, or compost divided by no pre-equilibrium. And you can see that there is a difference, right? And in, it's interesting that the difference is larger for peripheral collisions. So peripheral collisions are large impact parameters, smaller system being formed, right? And the pre-equilibrium in these cases are more important. They affect more the spectra, which is, you know, in the direction of our intuition, right? So it's less hydrodynamic evolution. So what happens before hydrodynamics is more important. That's why you see a bigger effect here. Another way to see the same result is the mean PT uh, of, the, of the particles. I showed the mean PT of the pions, the kaons, and the protons obtained from our code. And you can see the difference with no pre-equilibrium and with pre-equilibrium here is the, the final one. And then we change the type of or, or what we do in the pre-equilibrium, if it's free streaming or if it's effective kinetic theory, and then you again see some differences here. So that's, it's very nice that you can go into your model and switch on and switch off things. That's what we did. Details uh, can be found in this reference, right? Uh, again, not only the PT, but we also look at uh, the, the VNs, V2, V3, for instance, two particle correlations, the, the correlation uh, on, on uh, 
what we call collective flow here, okay, V2 and V3. And again, we obtain good agreement with the experimental data, but again, you can see the differences by turning on and off the pre-equilibrium phase. So this is very nice what we can do. We can, again, check different observables and see how sensitive they are to the different parameters that we have. We can go further and we can start playing a little bit more. So this is something that we know. Some people show, showed already that this V2, the final uh, a correlation between in the momentum space on heavy ion collisions is strongly correlated to the initial spatial eccentricity. We know that. So this is, this is the relation, the correlation that you see between the two of them. The blue dots is from our simulation. And you see nicely, since it's a simulation, you know the eccentricity of your initial condition because we control the initial condition. So I can choose the eccentricity of my initial condition and I can check the V2 on my final state particles and I can show nicely with these blue dots what what are the, 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 what is the correlation? I can even do a mapping between the two of them, uh, between the eccentricity and the V2. Now I can go further and turn on some, some fluctuations, uh, multiplicity fluctuations, see what the effect of that on this correlation. And then you see these red dots here. So again, you can start turning on and off different parts of our, our, our code to see the effect on the final observable, final experimental observable. Uh, I think I don't have much more time, so I'll, I'll go and skip this one. But this is also, uh, this is a test of, of uh, the sensitivity, sensitivity of a new observable that people started using, again, on correlation. This is called principal component analysis. PCA is another way to look at V2 and V3, but in a more detailed way because it allows correlations between different PT bins. So again, you can turn on and off different parts and see how it affects uh, this PCA observable here. We have a nice paper on this showing the correlation between PCA variables and, and, and the eccentricity. Uh, going back to the, to the mean PT, the spectra that I showed you, I already told you that the pre-equilibrium phase makes a difference in, the, in the, the mean PT of the particles, in the shape of the spectra, hence on the, on the average PT of the spectra, right? So what we did now is we went to the smaller system to proton lead collisions instead of lead lead. And again, we see that there is, in this case, a much bigger effect. Remember I told you that in peripheral collisions, the effect was bigger. If you go to smaller systems, the, the effect is even bigger, right? And then again, we, I can start changing knobs in my code, changing, for instance, the time of the pre-equilibrium. This is the time of, of, of the length that we use for the pre-equilibrium phase 0 0.37 or 1.2. So this makes a huge difference on, on the mean PT of the particles, right? Now, one more thing that we found is compost is this, this, this code uh, that considers effective kinetic theory, but it, it, it uses conformal symmetry. So the, the, the particles don't have mass there, right? But hydrodynamics is not a conformal theory. So there is a discontinuity in physics there. There's a conformal theory plugged into a, a non-conformal theory. And, and we found out that that creates a, a, a artificial bulk pressure. So we, we wanted to show that this artificial bulk pressure does make a difference in the final observable. So you, you see the difference between the green and the, and the orange curve here and, and this artificial uh, bulk pressure creates this huge difference in the PT, in the mean PT of the particle. So now we are working on a new pre-equilibrium code. We're solving some equations to have a new kinetic theory that does not have, does not use, make use of conformal symmetry. Uh, and, but we don't have that yet. We're working on it. Uh, but artificially, you can just show that, you know, if you change, for instance, in the free streaming case, if you change the velocity of the expansion, you change from C to something smaller than C by mocking a free streaming of non-conformal piles, right, with mass, then you can see that the difference goes away, right? So it does seem that, indeed, this shows us that this bulk pressure is artificial, and it comes from the fact that we are doing a wrong matching between conformal and non-conformal theories. Uh, we can go further. We can use these results. I showed you that we can describe these, these models were fitted to the experimental data. So within the range that they were fitted, they describe fairly well uh, uh, the experimental data, right? Everything works fine. 
community is happy. We have, you know, uh, a model that has 27 parameters, or I'm, I don't know the actual number, but a large number of free parameters, and you, you, can, you can, you know, tune that so that you can describe the data. Now, can this data describe, predict new results? That's what we did. So we went to what we call ultra-central collisions. So the, 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 the models that exist, they usually fit to centrality 0 to 5% or 0 to 10%. It's a, it's a, it's a very central collision. Per impact parameter very close to 0, but it's not 0. But the experiments, as the amount of data grew, at least, for instance, measured a lot of data we, on, on a centrality region that we call ultra-central, that the impact parent is very close to zero. So, and those were not used on the FITs. Now we went in and used our code to simulate the experimental observables, V2 and V3 and V4, for this ultra-central data. And here is the result. This is another paper, we just published it. Uh, uh, where we, sh we, we show that we cannot describe the VN in ultra-central data. And this is, uh, uh, you can see it better here, the ratio between V3 and V2. So this is the experimental data. This point is used for the fit, so you see that it agrees with the models. But here are the models the, the, with the parameters from the Dutch group or the Jetscape, or uh, here is Dutch group and the Jetscape. And this is the CMS experiment <coughs> result. And you see that no matter what we do, we cannot describe this data. So there's room for some improvement. Something is missing in, in the codes, the existing code. So that's great because that means that we have something, some new ideas. We are hoping that our new code for pre-equilibrium uh, uh, that does this non-conformal pre-equilibrium phase might take care of this. Uh, this is something we're working on right now. Also, to have such a nice tool uh, allows us to play a, a little bit and, and have some new ideas, some cool ideas. So this is an idea that we had. We have the quark gluon plasma. We describe quark gluon plasma nicely with hydrodynamics, with a liquid, a liquid phase, liquid-like phase, right? And then we also see, I'm, I'm very sorry I missed Brian's talk this morning on jets, uh, but we know in heavy ion physics that jets do interact with the medium jets are, are suppressed in the medium. It's called the jet suppression effect. So when you have a pair of jets, the, uh, two jets being produced in a, in a quark gluon plasma, uh, the original measurements done at RIC show that one of these jets might be suppressed, might be killed by the interaction with the medium. We have several other uh, uh, evidence of that nowadays. But we thought he, if we have jets in the medium here, in the liquid, these jets might create something called vorticity. So you, have a, you shoot a bullet in a bucket of water. What you will create is vorticity in the liquid. Can we see this vorticity in the liquid? Right? That was the idea that we had. And so we went in and simulated this. Right? So this is a result of our simulation. It's a, it, it, we, we insert a jet into the medium. And what we do is we measure the vorticity, the longitudinal vorticity. And you see nicely, the arrows are the, the gradients, the velo velocity gradients of the, of the medium. And you see the vorticity, the blue and the red are the vorticity. I don't know how, if I can go back. It's a nice video, so uh, I, I, I can't go back. I uh, had to use the mouse to go back there, so. Sorry, but you, you can see nicely the dynamics of the evolution of the vorticity inside the medium, and that's what we did. But in the end, we want to see if this can be measured. And yes, we can measure this by, now nothing works. Vocês podem andar um pouco para frente? Oi? Ah, no, video de novo. <laughs> so, yeah, here's the video again, and you see nicely the vorticity evolving through the system, right? And can the vorticity be measured, be seen experimentally? And yes, we can. Uh, so that was the idea that we had. So this is, again, the same design, the drawing of what's happening. You have a jet going through the medium, and this will create a vortex ring. Just like when you, you're in the water and you just 
you put your hand through the, through the swimming pool and you see these nice vortex rings forming. So that's the idea that we had, this vortex ring formed in the quark gluon plasma. And so this is a picture of the vorticity again, now looking at uh, uh, this transverse plane to the, to, the, to the jet. So the jet is coming out of the, the screen here and you see nicely the, the vorticity here. And we can use this vorticity. This vorticity will generate an alignment of the particles with the vorticity of the spin of the particles. So we would have polarization due to this vorticity. Experimentalists measure polarization in the quark gluon plasma using lambda particles because it's convenient to use lambdas. It allows us to measure uh, 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 polarization. And this is the study. We, so this polarization was inserted into the ISS to the particleization code, and we look at the final result. So this is already a result published in this, this paper from the 3C collaboration, where you see the signal and we propose a new observable called the ring observable. You basically integrate over this ring. So, so you get the, the best out of this, right? So you use the jet direction as a reference, and then you, you integrate over this ring, and this is what you get. You, you see the two rings, the upper part and the lower part here as a function of this angle, azimuthal angle here, okay? So this is a, a new observable that we propose for the experiment to see if vortex rings are being formed by the jets that are thermalized in the medium. This is a very cool idea because now you can show how the medium is responding to the interaction of the jet with the medium, right? Uh, we have a follow-up paper that we just submitted yesterday, so I don't have an archive number yet because we submitted yesterday. It was a work done by a master thesis student at Unicamp where we actually now go closer to the experiment. We use now, in our first paper, we, we just did a smooth initial condition. We wanted to, it's a proof of principle. We wanted to show that it actually can be measured. Now, is that Bill Christie? <laughs> I know. So now we go to, to, to a, a, a situation much closer to, to the experiment where you have fluctuating initial condition and we are actually change the position where we insert the jet in the medium. Because in the, in the original paper, we inserted a jet smack in the middle of the quark gluon plasma. Now I, I, I sort, I randomize the position where we, 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 we dump the, the jet energy into the medium. And then sure enough, this is the ring observable, the integrated ring observable here. And this is the simulation for different scenarios like fluctuating initial conditions or smooth initial conditions. And distributed X is, is by varying the position of the jet insertion. And you see that they give consistent results. So it's a very stable experimental observable that can be checked by the experiments, right? And the, the, the open ones are when you don't insert the jet and sure enough, you don't see anything when you don't insert the jet. So this is the kind of, uh, uh, two uh, plays that we can do with our, our, our tool, the extreme collaboration chain. Another cool idea that we had was, well, I just showed you how a jet in the quark gluon plasma could create vortices and these vortices could be measured. But now if we look at PA collisions, you have sort of like a proton going through the nuclei. So this might also create vorticity in within the hot medium created by the PA collision. So that was the idea here. Can we also see polarization to, due to this vorticity created by a PA collision? And that sure enough, we, 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 we simulated that also with the same experimental observable. Now, except that the, the, the jet direction here is the direction of the proton beam, right? And then now if you look at the vorticity plots here, you can see nicely that there are large vorticities uh, it depends on how, how much vorticity you create here. It, it, will, it will generate a final observable here. If you look at the observable itself, here are the curves for as a function of uh, pseudo rapidity on PA collisions. And this is the blue lines are when you consider a system like this, where you actually have a gradient of velocity from the edge of this system to the center. Here, we consider everything uniform. So in this case, you don't have any vorticity because the velocity distribution is the same as opposed to here where we, we inserted artificially a, a velocity gradient, assuming that there is some difference between uh, the, uh, the edge of the system and the center of the system. And that's what you see here. So again, we propose nice experimental observable that can be checked 
by the experiments. So that is the idea and the success of the chain we built. So let me finish within time, I think, hopefully. Let me summarize by saying we put together successfully a complex hybrid simulation code for heavy ion collisions. This was a, a challenging, but uh, uh, successful in my point of view, uh, uh, test that we, we perform. But more importantly, we put together a complex and hybrid group of people with common topics of interest, theorists and experimenters. This was a much more difficult, much more challenging work than putting together the, 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 the state-of-the-art codes. But again, I could say that we were very successful and, 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 and we have some very nice results out of it. And, and I think that the best result that I can mention here, especially for our community here in Brazil, is that we were not only able to get uh, uh, results that can be tested by the experiments, and I think that's very important. We, we propose new ideas and new observables that actually can be tested by the experiments, but we formed new collaborations to increase the, the, the size of the community, which is very important for us. Thank you very much. It's not on, but it's okay. I can hear you. Results for photons. And for photons. No, we don't. Uh, you have perspective to do it. Or... Do we expect to do photons? You mean photons from, from the system, produced by the system? Yeah, like, for example, to explain V2 of direct photons or it's kind of direct things. photons. No, no. We don't have, and no, we don't expect to do it in the near, we, we would need- But you can do it if you want. We could, if we could input into the code, not in the sampler, well, maybe during the sampler and during the evolution steps where we would produce direct photons, then we need you guys, the theorists, to tell us how, to, how these things would be produced. So that, that's the cool thing about the toy that we, we put together, right? I mean, it's there. Well, now you theorists come and say, well, no, I have this code. This, is, this happens all the time with Giorgio, with too, too often, actually, right? That's the problem with Giorgio. And he comes with a new idea, and then we, you know, we, we look at it, and can we insert this? You know? And, and that's, that's what we do. That's what we did with the polarization, right? I mean, obviously, we went to the theorist and we were, or the specialist in polarization, which was Mike and Chun, we, we specialist on the ISS, and we inserted into the code this polarization part. Now, if you tell us this is how the photon would be produced and the polarization of the photon would be like this, we can insert into the code and test it. Yes, yes. That goes into the last part, which is new collaborations. I'm here to find new collaborations, right? Okay. And a, a second question. Yes. Uh, comparing to the, 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 the known results for lambda polarization, what your observable, the one you described last, uh, could add? Uh, what could you tell that we don't know from the, the, the actual results. No result from the polarization. You, you mean from Alice? Yes. Well, uh, you got to be careful. Those are global polarization, right? It's a global polarization measurement, and it was expected that the global polarization would be smaller at the LHC energies. This is different. This is polarization created by a jet being uh, thermalized, being, being, being stopped by the medium, right? So. It's completely different because now you measure polarization around the jet direction, right? One of the, the, the questions that people would ask is, well, since the jet was thermalized, how do you know the direction? Well, you have the back, if you, if you look at a photon jet, right? You could, you could use that, right? But we show that you, you don't actually need to do that. You, you can just apply some cuts on, on momentum and then you, you integrate over and you, you will still have a signal. Okay, that, that's the, the, the beauty of having an event by event code that you can actually simulate what happens in an experiment and check if you can measure it, right? Uh, uh, so it's, it's completely different from the global polarization stuff. But see, if, if we see polarization around the jet, you prove but that the jet the is actually interacting. Global vorticity doesn't affect your, I mean, you can perfectly distinguish 
than both. Sure, sure. Okay. It, because the way you measure, you trigger on the jet. It's very different from, from, from the, yeah. Other questions? So uh, one of the issues that we'll have, uh, or that we do have at the EIC is a, a lack of a general purpose EA generator. Um, and I know for Jetscape, there was some, I don't think it really went anywhere, but there was some idea that you could, because it was so modular, you, mm -hmm. could, you could modify it to maybe do EA. Is, is such a thing possible? Uh, with with your collaboration, and do you have any uh, any thoughts on moving in that direction? Um, is it possible? Yes, anything is possible. Uh, do we have thoughts on going into that direction? Not at the moment. No. Uh, what would it take to do it? Not only the collaboration of the specialists on on how to to simulate whatever system we formed in the EA uh, uh, collision. I'm, to be honest, I'm not very uh, knowledgeable in EA collisions, uh, so I don't, I don't even know. But we made it modular enough that we could plug in a different, like, like the initial condition, we changed the initial condition. We go from, from, from Trento to CGC and we, we test different initial conditions. So in that sense, we could do it now. What's the validity of, of that chain? That that depends on, you know, what you, you, you do afterwards and how the results come out and how it will compare to the EIC data. Definitely, definitely. All right. Thanks for the nice talk overview. You know your your project. You know the the budget of the project coming mostly for PS and PQ or NCT. You can speak about that. The budget of the project. Uh, the, 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 it's, it's basically for PSP. It's basically from the Temachico. Uh, so the idea of this this grant, this Temachico, was really to form this collaboration. We were plagued by the pandemic and the and the the social isolation. So that uh, because we had planned a lot of uh, visits, right? To 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 not only to the experiment, uh, to Alice, but to, to so, some theory collaborators and so on, which none of that happened because of, of the pandemic, yet we were able to maintain and, and, and progress uh, with that. I think that uh, we, we lost a lot on the Brazilian community. There are much more people involved in the Temachico that in the end did not, you know, the, the list that I showed here for the extreme collaboration or the 3C collaboration is much smaller than the list that of the original people in the Temachico. But that greatly was affected by the pandemic. So we, we could not go to Rio and sit together and work and, and, and things like that. So uh, that's very unfortunate, but still we were able to successfully put together this code. So, okay. I don't see any other hands. So thank you very much again. <laughs>
Aqui né? não tá saindo, tá? Não tá saindo? O som, tá? O azul agora tá desligado? Não, tá ligado agora. Som, som reu...
uh, there will be maybe a second presentation, Elko or somebody else, and then uh, people uh, will start interacting, and then of course uh, the uh, your question and contribution are very welcome. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Very good. Uh, thank you very much for organizing this uh, this, uh, this roundtable. And we don't have any profound things to say, but there is information that we would like to give you. Uh, this is supposed to be something as a starter of a discussion, and then hopefully that will mount all the discussion that will follow with different people coming from different backgrounds and, and specializations and activities within the electron ion collider and even sub something outside. So I'm presenting this uh, on behalf of Daniel Tapia Takati, Christine Aidala, Jean Delalian, and Carlos Bodulani. I guess you know some of those people. Uh, what we thought about two years ago was that there should be some way to support and encourage activities on the American continent between United States, Canada, and all South and Central America, Latin America, the whole continent. The idea was to bring them into the discussions of EIC, particularly younger people, students, postdocs, and make funding and other kinds of supervisory support available to all of them. That was the original idea, and you will see it has grown beyond those, even to the, to the, to the European continent a little bit. It's starting. So I'll, I'll show you all that. We called it the Inter-American Network of Networks for QCD Challenges. So it's an inter-American meaning all of these things are involved, Canada, United States, and all countries within, uh, within the Latin American continent. Uh, and it was, uh, we, didn't, we decided that we would approach various existing networks, because we realized that lots of people were already, already organized, and we thought that the most effective way to get to them, to the younger people, and the people who are interested in getting involved was through that uh, network. So it was a network of networks uh, for QCD challenges. And we approached NSF, and they, we went through a funding uh, review. And now we are funded for such a, such a thing uh, for three years. And I'll tell you what we have been doing and where we are. Ah, yeah, okay. there you go. Okay, so the program goals were fourfold. Develop strategic partners across the various basic research networks in the Americas, North, Central, and South, to tackle important QCD challenges. Recall, we did not specify this only for the EIC. EIC is a future goal, but this can mean that every person interested in some way in QCD studies can be part of this, our network. Identify needs, strengths, and synergies of network partners for developing large-scale science projects in the U.S. Uh, design activities for researchers in the U.S., Canada, Latin America that will facilitate leveraging complementary resources for QCD research and enhance the training for the next generation of researchers in novel skill sets that include, uh, that, that include inter, uh, international multi-team uh, 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 entities and experience. So that was the broad goal on which we uh, launched this effort. Uh, the topics we included are accelerator technologies, of course QCD theory, um, higher performance computing, particle detectors for experimentalists and instrumentation in electronics, data acquisition, real-time event selection, software development, uh, development of Monte Carlo simulation, and as it was becoming a, a, a place where things were about to expand, AI and QIS tools, which can be used in QCD and beyond, were also part of that discussion. We had a kickoff meeting at Stony Brook University in December 16, about two years ago. Uh, that was mostly remote. I, I see some people here who were already part of that discussion. So some of them, what we have uh, done since then, you will, you will recognize. But there were a lot of people who were remotely present. I think that was also a very interesting and very positive thing. We had about 120 participants. And mostly, uh, they were from US as well as uh, the South American continent and, and Central American continent. So some examples of our activity are we support organization of workshops, conferences, and summer schools. We have support for uh, travel, particularly for younger uh, early career 
uh, and uh, mid-career scientists. Uh, there is mobility we can support is from any US person to anywhere in Canada or Latin America or Central America. Or you can have a Canadian or Latin American person coming to US for anything that is related to QCD and collaboration. Very broadly defined. As I said, you haven't seen the word electron ion collider yet because we necessarily wanted to do that because we want to encourage the existing researchers in ALICE and CMS and uh, uh, people at RIC, uh, those who want to collaborate for the greater good of QCD in the long run. We want to get them in, in that. Young scientists in that events, we encourage people to lead efforts. Once they come into the picture, they can, we can support some of their workshop leading activities that give them higher visibility. Projects that come promote development of early career researchers, activities that promote better communication amongst scientists. So we also uh, are willing to support any necessary activity that leads to a white paper, that leads to a project evolves into a funding funded source and NSF is through our organization is happy to support it. So we have had so far, uh, you can see, or if you go to our webpage here, which I will come back to, uh, it is interested in supporting following types of activities. Exchange visit programs, early career research projects, participation organization of scientific meetings, and strategic partnership that will expand beyond our current activity. The 2022 call for, and it's, it's called even, so we actually take proposals from you. So we don't dictate what you want to do. You tell us what, what is interesting, and we, if it falls anywhere close to this, we have been given enough flexibility by NSF to actually approach it. If you ask for something that is not directly part of it, our interest, our question goes to NSF, and they have been extremely fast in responding to say, okay, modify this and follow this. So, so they have been very, very supportive of, 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 of all these. So the first application here is closed, but we are uh, uh, about to start a new uh, proposal for 2023-24. So let me show you what has happened in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, remember, when we started this, we were just coming out of COVID. So there was nobody was willing to travel um, and people were restricted to traveling from to national labs, for example. So we had lots of uh, extra money from save from the first couple of years, which they did not take away. They let it go and they, they were very willing to be very flexible. And since then, for about last one and a half years, there have been accelerator exchange visits between Mexican uh, uh, students who have, who have uh, uh, visited Jefferson Lab uh, and Triumph, sorry, uh, Mexican st uh, students and some Triumph scientists have come to Brookhaven and Jefferson Lab for EIC related activity uh, in the accelerator R&D and training. There have been experimental physicists. Uh, this is one example that is just ongoing. She's a student from uh, Chile who is visiting uh, Fermilab for uh, work related to, I don't exactly know what EIC work she's doing, but she's an experimentalist and I think she's uh, more involved with QCD, uh, of, uh, of the US QCD group. And that's what the, she's working with that and that's what, what, that, what uh, she's doing. And then there are theory research exchange programs between UCLA and uh, BUAP, uh, research exchange program between SMU and uh, IF uh, UNAM and uh, uh, the new ideas or topics of production of exotic systems at the EIC, the research visitors, I think, were, were being discussed uh, as we speak. Participation from Latin American co uh, colleagues in the US uh, uh, APS, BNP meetings, we can support that. So if you are interested in presenting things in the US uh, meetings, or if you want to bring someone from the US to your meetings here, uh, we can support that, and this is something that we have done very routinely now. APS DNP, last two years, we have lots of people who came in. DIS, uh, where is, uh, we had uh, people coming from Mexico and Argentina who we have supported. And the Center for Frontiers in Nuclear Science, there is a link here, I will not talk too much about it. It's a center, it's a joint center between Brookhaven and Stony Brook, which is set up at Stony Brook as operations, uh, uh, in, uh, but there are two parts of it. And uh, you will see there are lots of workshops that go on for electron ion collider and related topics. And uh, many of our visitors uh, can be and have been supported. We've supported participation from several US participants at workshops um, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the associated countries. Uh, we had a mentoring uh, workshop at DIS, which we were 
very surprised for students and postdocs, early career uh, uh, scientists, which were very surprised and very happily seeing how much response we got and what, what reactions we got from them. So that's something that we can do. Uh, we are planned to have a student day at the Quark Matter, which is coming up. So we are investing in, in getting senior people to communicate their experiences, either career or academic and non-academic, how, how you go through this process. Um, and that's something that we are planning um, in, in Quark Matter. In July 20th, on July 20th, a suggestion from that came from the NSF itself, we will hold a meeting with uh, scientific attaches from all these countries that are involved. So the your uh, embassies in Washington DC or any large city in the US has someone called a scientific attaché. They are aware of the scientific, or they, are made, they need to be aware of the scientific interest of their own country scientists in any of the large projects. And something that we have learned recently is that sometimes that, that contact is not there. So if, it is, if, if it, that happens through the, your scientists, scientists talking to the scientific attaches, who then report to the interest to the ministries of science and, and government, this has been very useful. And once we convey that to NSF, they are encouraging a day uh, in this half a day meeting in Washington at NSF probably, they will provide us for the local uh, support there and the in-person uh, meeting, principal scientists from interested to city science uh, participating countries are welcome to join in person, but there also will be a remote possibility and that is something that you will get to know who the person is if you already don't know and tell them what you're interested in, what your activities are. So hopefully that will help you bring in the support you need either outside or inside for your groups or, uh, and then I think I mentioned to you a one day uh, uh, activity, uh, what we, we are planning to do as a satellite meeting in Quark Matter uh, 2023. Uh, we hope that we will always have one meeting a year as long as the grant exists for in person uh, associated with a large meeting like that, and then another one to follow up on activities or propose new activities on, on Zoom. There are also new directions. This is a, um, we want it to be a thing that is driven by new ideas. If you have a practical idea that you want to pursue, you should propose it to us and we will try to implement it as best as we can. So it is, we are considering opening more targeted calls for proposals. That's obvious, we, we know what is working. We want to, uh, in fact, form representative groups of early career scientists who can then lead all of those activities on their own. We don't need to micromanage or we don't intend to micromanage, so that's something that we're trying to do. We are also, there's a lot of interest in the European Strong 2020 program to see if we can expand those connections to Europe, because obviously, the science at LHC is connected to QCD at EIC and any other uh, uh, project that we are talking about. So to have them uh, be part of this just complete makes sense. So although it is called the Inter-American Network, NSF is very willing to consider such combinations, horizontal connections to uh, facilities in Europe. Uh, as I mentioned to you, want it to be a community driven uh, effort. We are here only to coordinate aspects of it and new ideas from you are essential and uh, important. So here are the contact information. Daniel uh, Tapia Takaki is the principal uh, PI, I'm the co-PI, but we have Christine Idala, Jim Dalalian, and uh, Carlos Vazuluni. If you are already in connection with them, if you think that that is the way to approach, you can contact any of us and, and we will uh, take your request and, and see what can be done. And these are the important links associated with it. So this was, uh, make sure that we understand, this was essentially prepared by Daniel. I was just a, uh, a presenter for him. He could not come. That's it, I think. Okay, thank you. So um, it's an improvised talk, okay? Um, so I'm, I'm recycling a few talks. Uh, one is actually something that we prepared, a slide that we prepared for this uh, scientific attaché two years ago. Uh, and the rest is about uh, the case for students, for Latin American students, but with the, the experience of Mexico. Okay. So this is not really on behalf of the net, of a network of Mexico, because I think there is a QCD network 
Uh, I am not part of, are you part of that network? There's, there was a new network created based on the fact that you would network. I am not part of that, but um, my project with the INN was on the list, right? So you can see that um, it's, it's just, it goes beyond the network. Okay, okay so uh, that's the Mexican flag, and I will talk about EIC physics community and Mexican institutions. Okay. I'm sorry, I apologize if I forgot someone. So this is kind of, um, that's, that's Mexico, okay? And that's points where I know people who do QCD or QCD related uh, activities. I just, so that's uh, where Adnan is, so I just put the logos of people here. Uh, so Kepani, uh, you were there too, so you count as, as being part of that somewhere here, it's Morelia, and that's my institute, right? It's, uh, it's Ifunam, it's, it's Unam, so it's Mexico City. So you have Puebla here, San Luis Potosí, Colima, Culiacán, Sonora, okay? It gets, it gets warmer around here, right? So, okay. uh, so we have a lot of people doing uh, QCD, uh, I won't talk about experimentalists, we tried to g gather with them, but it, they decided that they need to have separate fundings because it's much more involved for them to, uh, to find the funding, and so they decided to have their own uh, way of doing things. But that's a list of, of theorists that I can think of, and I say in company because, um, because they are much more than that, and I probably forgot people, but, and we all have a lot of, a bunch of students that work with us, and so what we, uh, we had to prepare, so we were approached by, um, it was Walter de Koning, uh, two years ago to prepare a slide for this attaché. We never heard back from that person, but we sent the slide, okay? And, and so uh, officially in the EIC user group, I will, that it will change because I will send Adnan the link so he can register as well. Uh, so we are uh, four institutions, which is in the staff, which is in the north of Mexico City. Uh, was, it's, uh, Universidad Autónoma de Sinaloa, UDLAP, where is Martinichinsky at UNAM, and in UNAM we have diverse institute as well. And so we have experimentalists that are ex in the exploration phase of how they can enter the EIC, that's why they need some time, and theorists, I think we are kind of cons consolidated, and we uh, have been working kind of actively in that field for quite some time. Then the funding we have, uh, the basic fundings we have from theory comes from CONACYT, which is the equivalent of DOE, if you like. And UNAM also have uh, internal fundings, but basically that's, that's what we have, that's the only thing we can have. And our attaché would come from, it would be the, the head of CONACYT, so she would be the person of uh, thing. And so uh, that was two years ago, we had about uh, 10 students involved uh, from the theory side, and I don't know, I, I can't talk about everyone, but that was what we, uh, we collected at that time. And we also had events, we had Hadron 2021 happening in Mexico. It, it happened online, but it was in Mexico. We get different uh, events. We have a lot of um, workshops on uh, accelerator protocols and also forward physics happening in Mexico. We were part of the Yellow Report. We were part of the snow mass for EIC. And uh, we have subtopics that goes from spectroscopy to structure. So there's a lot of things happening in Mexico. So that's for the activity, and I apologize if I forgot to mention something. And, and of course, the Stringer Dyson activity that is well represented here. Uh, okay, so now let me just uh, make the case. So that, those are slides are prepared to, uh, to convince other people to find fundings for our students. And we have this, this wonderful program that we call uh, Verano Scientificos, which means um, scientific summer stay. So it's their internship. We organize that for, um, for theorists, and I think there is uh, another program for experimentalists that might have been funded by you. I, I, I don't know who's funding that, okay? So I will just talk for the theorists. So my colleague here, Saul Ramos, uh, proposed that. So what we do is we have this, uh, this competition. It's a nationwide competition, and we have students to apply. They have to send a motivation letter. They are uh, late undergrad or early master students, and so they have for the first, uh, so that there is a committee that, that reviews the applications, and we check their motivation, their background, their CV, and then we make a list. We invite them to come to, it's mainly UNAM. Um, they will give a talk about uh, a topic that they are given, um, topic. And then there's an interview in English and we select the best students and they are sent to other, to other uh, places. So it started um, with ICTP in Trieste, then ICTP changed directions and, and then it, it was not supported anymore. And every time there's a change of director, there's a change of, of politics and the fundings and things like that. And so what we want, we really want to encourage um, this, this contact by, of our students uh, to go abroad and to work with other people. And we believe they are really well trained. 
Okay, and so uh, it gives us, uh, so in practice it's, um, it will spend two months more or less of summer, go summer, it's, it will be the, 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 the northern summer, right? So winter for, for Brazilian. Okay, so um, I took a, so what is the idea is actually um, we have a strong background in, in mental students because I think in Latin America especially uh, there is a lot of, uh, of emphasis towards the students. We really want to have these highly qualified students that they can so they can start to, uh, um, to do the PhD either with us or abroad. And uh, we are strongly, um, um, how would you say, we are strongly uh, advised to uh, have a strong connection with students and to train them well. And so, uh, so in Mexico, for example, we have a lot of people in really cutting edge topics like um, electronic physics, BSM, QCD, and most of them do research during their undergrad. And uh, okay, and so we, we know that they are really well trained, they have QFT uh, and all the, the things that are interesting. And just to show the, uh, what, what, what happened with those students, so since uh, 2012, we had 19 students that uh, participated to do some, that won this, this competition. Uh, out of them, 10 students have pursued or are pursuing right now a PhD. Uh, most of them, where they did their, their stay, so many of them were absolved by Jefferson Lab, <laughs> Jefferson Lab related um, uh, university, so you see William and Mary and all those things, some at Virtual Institute, and, um, and some, most of them are finishing the PhD program here, and you can see that, uh, and a third come, okay, so two thirds come from UNAM, and one third come from more provincial um, areas, as you can see here. But you can see that it's, it's a very successful program. Okay, so uh, for now, so for this, this year, so we, we made, um, we had a selection in, uh, in December, and so we had the, now the support from JLab, so the, the local host is archives for less, but this year's um, winner of the, of the contest will work with Dad Rogers, he was my student, <laughs> and with uh, MIT Peace of Minds, uh, Jens Seller is a contact, and UC Berkeley, it's Raul Vesenio. And you can see all those persons have some kind of connection with Latin America, and that's why they really want to support, because they know how good our students are. And so we would try to find, uh, so either for the Brazilian community to, to try to apply this kind of, of, uh, of scheme that we have, or for, uh, for you to try to find more funding to have more EIC-involved students. Okay, so that's how that's, uh, students presenting things. And so that was uh, a long time ago, and you can see uh, Fernandez Boyes and Cesar is here. I was there, and so that's why we have the people uh, the committee. And those are the, the, the selected students for the for this year. And so he's going to Berkeley, he's going to Mines, and he's going to Jefferson Lab, right? And so they will spend the summer there. And uh, mostly, so they have this a, a short project. So in the case of JLab, they go to Hugs, for example. So that's a re that's a, one of the agreements we have with Janway. They go to Hugs. They are kind of trained during Hugs, and then after they will do some research program and see what happens. And it has been really positive for us. Uh, so what is the benefit for the host institution is that um, well, they have highly qualified students that uh, can you know, be involved in their current projects. It's uh, it's people power, uh, or what you want to call it. Uh, they can recruit students for the PhD program, which we understand that it's always complex in the US. And sometimes people really want to have this, this channel of students coming uh, that you can, you can see if you, it, works, it works well with you or not. And there's an expansion of diversity and there's networking. So it's, it really covers a lot of things that is important, I think, for uh, American universities, uh, diversity, um, having students working for you so you can get to know them and then decide if uh, and how to make them stay with you, if you like. Okay, and, and those are, uh, so I want to, to show, so that's the person lab on their Facebook, they always share those things. So one of the, of this uh, success uh, story is Felipe Ortega. So he, 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 was, he was a winner in 2017, and now he's, uh, he's been uh, part of the, of the news of Jefferson Lab a few times. He is really successful in his PhD, and, and I think he's doing really well. So that was thanks to this. So he, he is an engineer. He didn't want to do that kind of physics, but then you know it happens that he loved that, right? So, uh, and I think that uh, Raul is, is pretty happy with him. Um, okay, so that's another. So that, that's from the webpage of uh, of Raul Vicenio, in which he shares his uh, his uh, excitement about um, about the program, and he's been. Uh, 
So it was a JLab before ODU and JLab, and now he moved to Berkeley, and he actually also uh, discussed and, and um, he negotiated uh, part of a grant for, for that, that program at Black G as well. That's why we know we have Berkeley as well. So it works really well. Okay, so just the success of the students. So some students, they have published papers. That's where they are now. I didn't get to, to know all of them, but some of them have, uh, have had a really successful um, career, also <coughs> based on their experience uh, abroad. Okay, so, uh, oh, sorry, I forgot. I have to remove it. It wasn't meant for CTEC, but now it's EIC, sorry. <laughs> I was trying to, I have to modify the slides, sorry. So that would be EIC related institutions. So the, the way it could be done is that they could be, they could be a supporting, um, they could be rotating um, institutions that could try to, uh, to either with these INN grants or uh, for other, other grants to have like uh, rotating institutions that would like to host. So depending on where students, or who would need students to go, say there's a need, um, not July because they already have some, but um, say Stony Brook, you, or you want theorists or BNL need theorists for a summer, there's a program, someone says, okay, I have this project for a summer stay, so this year I would like to apply for this grant to have a students coming with us. And then we would like to see in Mexico if there are, is it, there are students in, the, in that case and if they could go. So of course there is uh, a lot of things to think about like um, lodging, stipends, uh, and also passport, well, visa, not passport. The visa is important in that case. And so those are the things that we've been doing and I don't know if you have any questions I have from both sides the U.S. or Brazil, if you want to, to know from this experience. So I don't have uh, additional slides to what I showed on uh, Monday, but I actually would like to point out how important it is to work with the science attaches. Because what we are doing at the moment for Brookhaven and uh, JLab, actually the EIC project mainly, is that we work a lot with DOE. And DOE actually reaches out to the science attaches in Washington to talk about, okay, what is your country interested? And then uh, actually we get uh, kind of confirmation. We invite them uh, to Brookhaven to show them the site. We talk to them what the EIC opportunities are. And that can be extremely helpful because all of the science attaches actually have very strong connection to the funding agencies. And we have seen that for an example, a latest recent example is Korea and Japan, where both the science attaches visited us at Brookhaven. We gave them, uh, them the spiel of uh, what the EIC is, what are the opportunities to participate. And actually, it looks like that uh, results into funding uh, for both uh, countries actually for their uh, researchers in uh, these two countries. And I know that actually at the moment UE is in contact with, the, uh, with uh, Brazil, with also the science attaché and also with some people uh, at the funding agency. So in general, if you have worked at a US uh, facility, then the EIC will be different. It will be not the standard DOE facility, which you know, where DOE gives, uh, tells you what to do. We really want to change this. We want to make it a facility of international character. That means we have already made changes in the governance models, how we will run the EIC. We have uh, kind of created a research review board, uh, similar to what you have at the LHC, where all the international partners have a seat on the table, and DOE is one seat on the table. Uh, everybody comes and uh, we then discuss, for example, how the project moves forward now with people which make contributions uh, at the longer term, how operations will be and so on. So we really model it according to what we had at DAISY, that's where I come originally from and what the LHC does, so that the international partners contributing either to the machine or actually to the experimental program really have much more say into what happens. So it is really not, we are not, it will depend whether we have common fund contributions, we most likely think not, so that might not change uh, compared to what you're used to from JLab or from 
uh, rig so that the operation still mostly is paid uh, by DOE of the facility. But for the experiment and so on, we really kind of have um, a much more international approach to the facilities than it's normally done uh, in the US or Formula, for example, also has been. Dune is going a similar direction, but from what I understand from all the people, uh, the funding agencies are more happy with what we are doing at EIC because it is less complicated from what I heard. Then if it comes to contributing to the EIC, we welcome absolutely everybody. If you are a phenomenologist, if you are a theorist, absolutely. If you are an experimentalist, absolutely. And if you are an accelerator scientist, the same way. From engineers to PhD students to uh, senior researchers, we really, really would love to have everybody. There are ample opportunities. I showed the experiment on uh, Monday, so there's ample opportunity to contribute to the experiment, not only on uh, kind of building things. There is simulation, software, electronics, engineering. Actually, at the moment, and I, I, I had the links to um, the uh, jobs which we have. We have at the moment, I think, 100 jobs open for EIC at Brookhaven. And that goes for everybody. It, it, it is really from people which do administration to uh, high-level engineers. So if you are interested uh, to come and so on, uh, I, I know there's somebody interested to spend a sabbatical with us, an engineer. And we will make uh, that work. We are happy to have students working with us on whether it is through the program Abay just showed CNFS or other programs which we have available actually also at Brookhaven. There is many, and the thing is, sometimes you have to reach out because it is impossible to kind of discuss all of them. Uh, for the being part of the user group, there is no uh, rules to be part of this. Everybody can become a member of the user group. For the experiment, um, there is, now that the experiment is fully formed, there is some procedure to become a member, but it is also not that, you know, extremely uh, kind of constrained. I also would like to point out, we are not... Clearly, we are looking also for contributions that somebody builds a part of a detector. But we are not only looking for contributions, uh, financial contributions. We actually really welcome workforce in any kind of form or shape. We want people which come with and build with us something. Or uh, you set up a test station at your uh, university and you test silicon photomultipliers uh, for us, which is a great thing for the students. I know they love this. I had just built a, several detectors uh, for the star experiment, and we had a lot of students which really loved this. So all of these contributions are welcome. It is not that it is just through dollars on the table. We really would like to uh, intellectual contributions to the EIC, and that is also why the series is so important. Um, I haven't talked about we are planning a second detector at the EIC. Um, and actually there, one of the things is, is there physics, which is different than what we have been planning for the first detector. So is there ideas from the theory side, what could be done? And then how does this flow to the detector design for the second detector? Has it to be very different to what we are doing now? Should we kind of do a different type of um, R&D? And that is also something, we have a generic R&D program, which is administered through Jefferson Lab. And again, this is for detector research. Everybody can contribute. It is not only for US un uh, universities. It is from everybody around the world. And we have indeed contributions from people from Europe, from Asia, from everywhere. So, and the same is true. We have an R&D pro uh, program which is related to the project detector, so EPIC, which I showed. And also there we have, it was in my backup slides, and you can always send me an email. I am happy to answer any question. We have different programs. You can kind of join assist uh, collaborations which are working on certain technology. And again, it is not only from the US, actually, as you have seen, the U.S. institutions for the experiment and the user group are actually not the majority. It is uh, in the order of 40% U.S. institutions and 60% Europe and Asia. 
and unfortunately not yet so many from South America and that's why uh, we are here to actually convince you that EIC is the coolest thing since sliced bread and you really have to join us and work with us on it. And uh, think about it, it's closer than the NHC, the flight is shorter. It's also an advantage. <laughs> so we really, really, really would like to have everybody and uh, the EIC will be different than the normal experience in the US working at the National Lab. So um, if there are any questions, particularly the younger people, it is your, it's kind of can be your future because we will start in eight years from now a data taking and then hopefully we run another 20 and then we have a lot of bright ideas how to upgrade the machine, the second detector. And um, so there are ample opportunities uh, to get involved on any level. And I'm happy to answer questions if somebody has some. Uh, I haven't anything prepared. I just wanted to add uh, to a few things that Aurora has said about Mexico. One of the things I, uh, you know, wanted to take the opportunity to mention about Mexican students going to abroad, especially uh, when they started visiting JLab. There's one of the persons who's sitting very quiet here in the audience. Uh, so I would <laughs> uh, like to mention that uh, back, I think, around in 2009, I had suggested this idea to Tony Thomas when he was uh, heading the uh, Theory Center in Jefferson Lab, and without hesitation, he accepted it to accept two students uh, uh, every year coming from Mexico, and I'm really grateful that it has worked out very well uh, for us since then. Mike Pennington took that up, continued with that, and it, it has continued to happen since then. I think the first student who, who came there was, was Skepani Raya, who is currently a postdoc in, in Spain in University of Huelva. And uh, last year, he was awarded the Few Body Systems uh, Young, Young Researchers Award. He was among the two. One was an Indian researcher, and one was he. So uh, he was, in a way, a formation of, uh, of all this collaboration between Latin America and, and US in part. So I, I'm grateful for those who were involved in it. Other than that, we also, uh, in Mexico, also in collaboration with Bruno, we have been uh, um, organizing a, a uh, strong interaction physics conferences every two years in Mexico and in alternate years we do it in Brazil. Uh, there will be one next year and hopefully at the end of this year we will have one in Morelia uh, and where all the international participants come and I think we would like to uh, continue and have a collaboration with US uh, uh, on a more permanent basis on that. Uh, that will be That will be excellent. Um, other than that, uh, QCD and Hadron Physics has also formed a part of uh, uh, summer schools that we organize in Mexico and Central America. We've been organizing it since uh, 2005, I think, in Mexico. It has happened about 17 versions of those schools in different states. Uh, that's to attract the younger generation of uh, uh, late undergraduate students and early postgraduate students. Um, and, and given lectures on various fields, uh, which includes uh, QCD and Hadron Physics and Quark model and everything. Uh, so uh, if a uh, US counterpart would like to participate in it, it will be great. Uh, in 2015, we started also for this, the same school for Central America because we realized that Central American students do not get a lot of opportunity to know about these programs. So it was started the first school in Guatemala and then we have had it in El Salvador, Honduras, Costa Rica. Honduras has held it twice and Guatemala also twice. And, and this year, Honduras is planning to organize it uh, once more. Uh, it's uh, many times uh, MCTP uh, has supported this school, uh, but if we would have also some uh, researchers visiting from US to give, give lectures on the fields that we cover there, I think it would be a great idea and opportunity uh, for um, um, forming uh, younger students uh, to become a part of this global and more advanced venture in, in future. That's all I wanted to, wanted to add, thanks. I think with this, maybe I should... Uh,
Yeah, I wanted to invite actually you guys to the to sit there and okay. No, no, please go ahead. Uh, uh, no, I, I I think the idea of uh, having the physics of EIC is not uh, that people in Brazil join it is not uh, uh, new. I mean, this came from J Lab and uh, many years. And uh, our students, many of our students, were involved in QCD research on phenomenology, people doing more uh, theory. But uh, in part of this effort, and this is what I want to mention, is that the workshops we've been organizing, Bruno has uh, been organizing, there is also, we have uh, our Hadron physics that is Victor will organize next year in March. And of course, it's, it's more wide because there is a piece of our community, I want to stress, that is a lot involved in nuclear astrophysics. So more equations of state, this is a big part. But there is a part, a reasonable part, I could say maybe uh, uh, between Sao Paulo, there is people in Rio de Janeiro, Maybe there is one uh, uh, in Goiás, uh, another one in, in Bahia, and people in the south. Maybe in theory, we can grab more senior people, around uh, maybe 20, no? or, something, or, or something like that. That, could, that is close to, I mean, uh, QCD, EIC physics, no? And... Uh, I think the major effort that we could, um, I mean, make more coherent, we are not coherent. I mean, Fernando is always, every year work also, uh, organizing a Hadron meeting devoted to the students, no? So th there will be one in uh, two or three weeks, no? Uh, Fernando in Rio de Janeiro. And we are organizing, I mean, uh, workshops like uh, similar to this, I mean, since quite a time. And I, I think uh, there is now one in September, I mentioned, light cone, that of course is very close to EIC physics. And maybe now I saw that uh, we could have participants, I mean, from EIC founded by INNC, so we should talk on that, because it will be an opportunity to have also the students. We have money to have the students in the participating. I mean, we can cover hotel. This we already, we are able through the INCT that is part of the, the network. And I think uh, we have to, in now our meetings, to, to make coherent this effort. People from my EIC, like you have done now, come and talk, because then we can have our students to interact. I think this is, I mean, very important. So we can take profit of uh, Litecon 23 to have sessions on EIC physics. I, I know that some of you are not, will be not able <laughs> to come, but okay. But uh, I hope uh, many of you can come. And uh, we can think on motivate, because I believe you are going to have students. And this was the effort. Indeed, I organized in 2009, no, uh, the light cone in Brazil, and we tried to have the students talking, giving posters. And Rio de Janeiro is very appealing, so I hope <laughs> students will come. Uh, this is uh, one point. Another point I wanted to mention is the, um, there was an idea, even Elke was before the COVID and before uh, IA and then uh, QCD to organize a workshop with Haru Tavake. Maybe we can think again on that, uh, but to motivate. The idea was to organize in the north part of Brazil. This is normally is more hard to have money for the students. I mean, so we can maybe think on this project again, no, uh, to organize that. 
The other point, it will be the workshop that we are proposing. And now uh, with Craig Roberts, maybe also to have more, more people from South America. And we drive to this region, this, I mean, to this direction. This is, we are just <laughs> discussing now to uh, resubmit. Uh, I think this is the starting. Uh, of course, I want to also to hear June. June is still here. Funny June. <laughs> on the bottom. But I, I just want to mention one more thing that was not clear from what uh, um, Elke uh, was explaining. Um, you, you mentioned about opportunity for engineer. Uh, I don't know if this is possible. To Normally, the uh, this good schools in Brazil for engineering, like the one I teach and, and uh, USP, Rio de Janeiro, and they they are they have the student in the last year to to have a project to conclude the course. But the the, the key point is money. Okay, this is very good because then we can think to motivate uh, the engineering to, of course, maybe they will be not in the physics, but software. Uh, I mean, you, you mentioned uh, artificial intelligence, codes, electronics. Indeed, I saw that in L LAC, I saw that. I saw Brazilian students there, engineering. So this could be something very good. And we need, maybe to discuss a strategy, maybe some of you should come. For example, to ITA is easy. And to talk to the students or to come to USP, I don't know, uh, Fernando is here. This could be a point because some of the engineering school, uh, engineering students, are, uh, they, some of them come to physics or to science. And maybe this is a great opportunity for them. This is always a... <laughs> I want it to happen. Okay, you, you want to say so. I want to start by this, uh, with the engineers. So if I talk about engineering students, I, what I talk about is also people which work with us on the accelerator. So it could be RF technology, magnet design, uh, um, any type of things on this vacuum uh, design, and then of course also detector design. But if I talk really about engineering, I mean it very globally. And uh, indeed, we had uh, lately, we ha were very successful. We had, at, I think, in total, in the order of eight uh, engineering students, which were summer students with us. So very similar to what Aurora was describing, just from the engineering type. And then all of them have now permanent jobs at Brookhaven. So they uh, came for two, three months, did a project with us in summers, and they came back in winter. Some of the projects were with the school because they had to do an, you know, like a master thesis or something like this. In the, in, in, you, exactly, you call, it, you call it slightly different in engineering, I know, a bachelor uh, project and things like this. And really, from this age, all of them have permanent jobs now with Brookhaven in the EIC. Some in civil, some on the accelerator side, some in RF and so on. So that's why I was saying it is much more global of how you can actually kind of get involved in the ERC than what is classically thought about being a physicist, an experimentalist, or a theorist. So we have really much more job opportunities and opportunities in general. It's not only about job, it's also kind of actually really getting educated uh, than uh, uh, what normally people think about. Uh, and this is something that always I, I wanted to boost, but, but maybe we have to think a way to, to, to approach uh, the student, uh, pro, uh, propose a program with fellowship. For example, we have many Brazilian students in Polytechnic. No, the last time I did from, from even from Sao Paulo, from USP, very good students. And uh, they, they went to Polytechnic because there was this program of fellowship. They regist, they are very good. Maybe there are others that will be more interested to, to end the course and do some practical work, uh, I mean, in the project of EIC. So this is something that we, we have to think how to propose and to offer. I mean, to, uh, to make a cow, I, I don't know exactly, but 
uh, I, I'm just expressing. This will be at the very basic level, maybe even in the physics uh, course, I don't know if it is more easy, because at least in engineering, I know that in the last year, they have a time they can go even abroad. This is not, I don't know if in physics is like that. Uh, okay. So I, I can comment on that. I think we have had such students come in uh, for their final year undergraduate studies. They come there for six months to eight months uh, research associateships, and there are ways to fund them. Uh, there are students coming from India routinely. They have to do that in the final year, and some of them have been engineers. So there are mechanisms to support them. Uh, they're not necessarily at Brookhaven, but there are other ways to do that. If there is a person coming from, from Mexico or any of the Latin American countries, I bet we can support it through the IANN for the, for the, for the period, yeah. And then uh, what I wanted to make a comment about something that you mentioned about these undergraduate students coming in for the summers. Uh, something we already have, but it is a DOE program at Brookhaven. Uh, uh, Mickey Chu is one of my coordinators of that, which has been very successful, but that is program. They come in at the summer and then they continue working on the same project for another semester afterwards, remotely. With, they have a local contact uh, in their own institute who becomes part of the program, so you increase the network that way. We could certainly some, think of s implementing something similar for any of the Latin American countries, and that is easy to support through our system. So if there are opportunities for senior undergraduate, you know, final year undergraduate, they are interested and then pursuing into PhD, that would be fantastic. And so that would make a natural connection. It doesn't have to be at Stony Brook. It can be at Stony Brook, it can be at any other institution that you have contacts with. But we have this, you know, because we can co cover it globally, I mean globally within the US, any institute can pick it up and we can support. So yeah, I mean, your, your colleagues, your collaborators in, that, that's certainly possible, yeah. Yeah, it becomes, and I think, I think we were, we were lucky is a very bad, odd word. Because we didn't spend a lot of money beginning, at the beginning because of COVID, we have leftovers. So I think we can, and the NSF wants us to get involved with ad, ad, additional thing. If we can start finishing that, they are then more interested in funding the next level. So it's up, it's really up to that point, yeah. In fact, we have, I'm, yeah, there is one coming to Stony Brook as a graduate student, I just learned. So congratulations, we'll look forward to seeing you and we'll support you in the summer <laughs> if you come early. So yeah, I'm glad to hear her that uh, she's coming, so yeah. So in, the, on, in these lines, for me, it would be very good to have some money to, to co-advise the students like they can do their PhD here, but stay one year abroad. For instance, Gabriel tried to go there to work with uh, Yuri Kovchekov. I don't know if he is in the, in the network as well. And uh, he applied for Brazilian money, but he didn't get because of few money, yes. But I don't know if it would be too difficult for Yuri Kovchekov to join the network and then he, he's ready to go, right? And also Cheryl is finishing her PhD, I don't know how does it work uh, for her to apply for a postdoc. Uh, there is a list of people in the network that, uh, or there is no postdoc uh, fellowships. And a third point, I live in an island. I have some pictures I can show you later. If you want to visit me, <laughs> it'll be nice. So uh, let, me, let me comment on that. Um, I already talked to him yesterday, and I think uh, if you have specific research topics already in mind, and if you have a specific researcher in mind, like Yuri Kochegov, it's really between you, Yuri, and the student to define the project and contact us, and we will try to see how, how, how to uh, work it out from the INA. It's very, we want to keep it very informal. There is no formal process, you contact us. And then Daniel, four of us, and the, uh, uh, Contact at NSF, just advise, you, advise us, and then we can make the decision. It's very quick. About the postdocs, I didn't talk about the center we have at Stony Brook and Brookhaven. It's called the Center for Frontiers in Nuclear Science. So if you, one of my slides has a link to it, so you can go there. So this was set up jointly with Brookhaven and Stony Brook in 2017 to promote EIC. 
And the activities there are workshops that you are hearing about. There are lots of workshops that we do about 10 of them in a year. But the second program is to support early career postdoctoral fellowships. So we have at the moment about 12 of them, 12 postdocs, and it is between theory and experiment approximately half and half. And some of them are even joined with remote institutions. So we have, so if you have money for half a postdoc at your institute and you want that person to work on EIC, I can send you half the salary of that person to work with you uh, on the EIC. You can collaborate with any of the scientists at Brookhaven or Stony Brook. You can choose. You can choose to work with uh, Raju. You can choose to work with Elka. Any topic that you have in mind, you can do that. And we can pay you half the salary for that. Yeah? And visits are essential. We expect those kind of postdocs to come to Brookhaven or Stony Brook for about two to three months so that you make strong contacts with the locals. So that's the possibility we have, that's what we do. In COVID, unfortunately, we couldn't do that, but now we are starting that. So I think it would be, you just go to the CFNS webpage and you'll see there's a place for postdoctoral fellowships. Not, not this one, unfortunately. Go back to, uh, I'll show you. Actually, we have a first Brazilian, I see, Fernando Serna former PG students here at the IFT, he's going to go for two years, uh, two months to Brookhaven. So he was very shy at the beginning, told me, ah, I'm not going to get this. He saw Raju's call, Raju, right, this QCD initiative. And well, from the theory side, it was interesting. I told him, just send, send, send your CV, apply, and he's going there. So the first one there, you see Center for Frontier Institute of Science. So you can click there, and you'll go behind, and you'll see all the, uh, all the and the postdoc will, um, the solicitation should come out within the next month or so. And there will be three, four positions coming up soon, or joint appointments coming up soon. So. So, indeed, you just mentioned the theory group at Brookhaven has at the moment a visiting program uh, related to EIC physics to work together with them on a certain things. It's shorter, uh, like two weeks a month or something. Or now for you, it's uh, two months for the two student. Ago, exactly, yeah. yeah. So it's not like a year or something like this. And uh, we just had, for example, somebody from England uh, there for two weeks on Monte Carlo things and so on. So it can be, um, and uh, the experimentalists are also there. We have been a good tradition, for example, doing studies on EIC physics where we combine theory phenomenology with experimental uh, people, which kind of generates the data and so on. Then we do fits together and a lot of CEIC white paper and so on has been exactly done like this. And I think we need this also if we want to realize a second detector. Last more, I mean, just to, to indicate, you know that there are standard places where people can go, or grad students can go to look for all the jobs that are available. There are links for all postdoc fellowship. If you don't know, Jefferson Lab, Brookhaven, they, they have links on the theory group to see. If you're a theorist and you want to do that, I think it's the largest source or, or a collection of opportunities for next year must be already on now because they like to hire it in September 1st. You know, so it's a, it's a quick circle. So if you that's what you wanted as a general statement, you should explore that right away. For Brookhaven, we are forced to advertise all positions. So nothing is done under the table or behind yeah. the back or anything. So if you go on the Brookhaven website, all positions are posted. And actually at the moment, I have a postdoc position for doing studies on the second detector. So if you have a really talented person, just tell him to apply or send me an email and then we can uh, look to this. So we really are forced. We cannot do anything else. Can you make a short comment? I think sometimes I have the feeling that some Brazilian students or postdocs are not really aware of this. Many of the postdoc positions are also they are published on Inspire, right? So yes. just yeah. go there and look. They, they come. And Inspire. usually in the US there's a, there's a certain calendar, right? Yeah. Postdocs usually, uh, I don't know, in theory it's usually January, February, or December. Yeah. There's a certain calendar. And so starting like November, December, start looking up, go send your CVs, apply to several places. Don't think like, just don't put your... So, you know. <laughs> just to clarify, anything that is a formal postdoctoral position for two plus X years will have a formal way of getting in. Even at our center, it will go through Stony Brook uh, in a hiring process. So it's not completely, okay, you decide and send up person. But if it is a short visit, then we decide this. So if you want to work with Yuri for a couple of months, that's something that we can decide. 
as, at the graduate or a postdoc level. We won't have the flexibility to give you a postdoc just between a conversation. Yeah. So what Elka emphasizes is important, just to make clear. Yeah. So postdoc positions, you have to go through the channels, but links are there. So you'll find those. Yeah. So before I open maybe to general questions, I, I'd like to make a continue on, on, on Tobias's. Uh, no, I just want to make one comment. Maybe we have to link all these opportunities related to EIC to the Brazilian Physical Society page. Yes. Because then we can, uh, uh, how I say, spread out much more because everyone that is associated, the student, will receive those information. Maybe and also, try. just become a member of the IC user group. Yeah. All this post yes, yes. Are then they, there. Maybe <laughs> this is the best, but <laughs> you get a lot of emails, but they're many important yeah. emails. Everything, yes. <laughs> sure. <laughs> part of the user group so it, and there is no taxation <laughs> other than those emails that you get so so all students and postdocs I highly recommend that just become part of the user group and you'll be in that list and every job opportunity gets advertised there so before I open uh, yeah, wait, wait. <laughs> now I actually have a comment this is gonna go to Zoom so on that probably the Mexican will continue later because they probably have the same problems or difficulties. My impression is here in the 13 years I'm here in Brazil, um, as everywhere in Latin America, we have almost as many theories, or even more theories than experimentalists, right? So that makes it a little bit more difficult for senior people. In our field, as Tobias said, so I, you know, I'm not gonna show a lot of slides, we have a lot of theories working, doing work related to hydrogen physics, heavy ion physics, JLab, um, Experiment is mostly, there are very strong groups, many cities, but especially here in the south, southeast, um, on, based on LHC physics, and before Rick, of course. No? Uh, so one thing is, especially in Sao Paulo, we are very privileged to have actually, besides federal funding, a very strong state agency. That actually, the ICTP here is mainly funded by the FAPES, by the Federal State uh, Agency, and it helps a lot. So the thing to send people, for instance, to Huck School, send somebody, we had students spending six months at Argonne, sending them to Europe. We have something we call sandwich PhDs, right? So they have four year PhD and they go for one year, they can go to any institution, just have to find a, uh, a supervisor. You have to do an English test, of course, sometimes that can be a little bit of a problem. We can train them and that could also be done in experiment. However, I'm thinking a little bit ahead is how, we def how do we form in the future senior people who are gonna open their own groups no, because in the future you want to have somebody who has an experimental group here and will do experiments, not only theories. Theories can give input, of course. I'm always happy and I'm happy to go to workshops. How can we, and that's maybe more for the Brazilians, we have one experimentalist, is what is the path to actually in the future, and we have to think about it because it's gonna be an accelerator that's important that we can't ignore, and uh, besides LHC, how can we have Experimental groups working on the ASC in Mexico, in Brazil, in Argentina, in Chile. Because so from my perspective now, most of the input is theoretical. So this is a very common uh, problem. And uh, we have been actually kind of working on this quite a bit. Because if you look to things which we do on the experimental side, there are enormous synergies with, for example, developments at the LHC at the moment. I just was last week at the LHC at CERN uh, to talk with the Alice people, and uh, because the ITS3 development, which they are doing and we are doing, we are doing together. So I think the, one has to look to what the people are involved at the LHC and then really build on the synergies which uh, happen between both programs. And the EIC has really many. There's also this new uh, European uh, R&D program, which is organized through CERN. And also there, um, the EIC makes actually major contributions already because we are ahead for some of the things and what CERN is now thinking and where they want to go. And I think this could be a possibility also for the experimental groups here to build on the synergies between what they are already doing for LHC and what uh, actually can be used at the EIC.
Yeah, just a different from, uh, I'm a theorist, but I, I know that people in Mexico are interested um, to, to join the EIC, uh, just that the dynamics of, of fundings in Mexico, and I guess elsewhere, I, I'm, it's, it's different because the, the amount of money they require is different than what we require as theorists. So, so perhaps uh, what um, I'm, I'm thinking and what I see it has happened in different uh, communities as well, that is there's a strong uh, community from the theory side like EIC, if, if we increase the number of people involved in the, in the EIC, there might be um, more um, um, momentum from, from the experimentalists to also join that. Um, and so I understand that the funding is, is, is different. And I also know that one country cannot fund all the initiatives, so they have to make decisions. And so that's something also that if there's a strong support from the theory side, uh, if we are big, you know, becoming a, a larger and larger community, then there might be a tendency to uh, to try to bring experimentalists to also join that community and perhaps the funding agency to say, okay, this is the, the next big project. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a common effort uh, and it's, it's different to fund for, for, for you than for us. So again, from experience, um, and uh, Europe is a bit special because you, uh, the UK, France, and uh, Italy are very strong groups in DIS since a long time because of HERA. But what we see um, in other countries, uh, what has happened is that, for example, there is a synergy form between, we have EIC Asia now which is, uh, and that could be something which you can think about South America or Central America as, as well, that uh, it's several groups, it's Korea, Japan, and so on, and they sometimes even think globally what they want to work together on. That can be theory, but also experiment. So then the, the money you have to raise, for example, to work on a detector is not so large because some part is done in Korea, some other part is done in Taiwan. And so they have, we just have been away uh, of me uh, to, to Japan where we had an EIC Asia meeting where all of these people, and maybe that is another opportunity because you mentioned Argentina, Chile, Mexico, Brazil, to form maybe a hub uh, in South America. I know so you have the high energy uh, hub uh, and uh, maybe something in that direction could also be an opportunity. Yeah, I, I know, sorry, just a, a small comment. I have a little bit of contact with Germans too. So I know, for instance, uh, many people who are, or currently work at BES, they're preparing at the same time FAIR, for instance. Okay, FAIR has completely different problems nowadays. That's a completely other mess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's not the question right now. But <laughs> <laughs> the idea is that, you know, people are working on something and are actually having working groups and start something new, right? Which trail up and you see, right? It's the same. Yeah. Or, or and Absolutely. If I may comment on something, or you can go to her, if you have someone. Yes, you. He is our experimenter. He should talk. You're the only experimenter this year. Maybe you said you had a comment on LK, so maybe. I think it was important for us to hear you. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> uh, we want to hear from everyone here that we can. So, so think about it. If you want a minute to, <laughs> then I can comment. But go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't. I don't have a comment. Maybe I, I have a. First of all, let me thank you for being here and 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 showing this. It's, it's very important for us, for the Brazilian community, to have open up these opportunities to us. I think it's, it's, it's let me try to describe a little bit uh, our community from the experimental point of view. I think, you know, these, these people are the theorists and they know way much better than I do. But from the experimental point of view, I think we are, it used to be, allow me for a little history uh, uh, talk. Uh, so most of the, the high energy or, 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 or uh, fundamental physics here in Brazil 
were done originally in the big centers in, in Sao Paulo and Rio, University of Sao Paulo, uh, and Federal University of Rio, and some of these places. And so we had these very important and very good physicists leading these, these efforts. Some of them went to LHC, some of them went to the US to Fermilab, and even in, in uh, University of Sao Paulo, from the group from where I come from, uh, we, we went to Brookhaven. Now we are at a point where a second or a third generation of physicists were hired in, in several universities. So to, to, it's a very unique situation where we have a lot of young uh, uh, permanent position researchers that are in these places that are not in these big centers, right? And so they would benefit a lot from programs like what you're proposing because they don't have the, the, the infrastructure and the financial supports that the big centers do to have students, to send students. So uh, uh, this is sort of like telling you, it, it, it will be very important, and it will be very important to take this message to these people that are in these smaller institutions along Brazil, in the federal, several federal universities, I think Tobias knows all of them, so Tobias is the guy, uh, uh, but you would agree with me, right? I mean, we, we have a lot of these new professors that were hired within the last 10 years, and they don't have the money that the big guys like Fernando has, right? I mean, he, he can just open his pocket and pay for everything. So, so I think that, let me thank you and, and, and say that it will be very important for us to take these opportunities to these people because they have students. What we need, and I think that's not unique to Brazil, is to the world, is manpower. What we need is qualified, good manpower. And one thing I can, and I'm not a Brazilian, one thing that I can tell you about Brazil is that it has a huge potential for manpower. If there's one thing that you can talk about Brazilians is they, they're motivated, they're creative, they're, our students are, you know, some of them are lazy like mine, but, but, but they are motivated. There's a huge potential. And now that we have distributed the first generation of people outside of the big center, our opportunity like the one you're bringing is very important and can benefit a lot. Now, the second point that I would like to make is that also at the same time, in the big centers, we, 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 we matured enough and we have critical mass where we can now contrib contribute to these experiments in a different way, not only with just manpower, right? I mean. As you, you know, we, 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 we designed a front-end chip, which was no small feature, funded by FAPESP. So we have a strong funding agency. We, we, we designed a front-end chip. As you also know, in Dune, a DOE project, uh, uh, the FAPESP and the state of Sao Paulo Unicamp is designing the whole cryogenic system of the Dune experiment. So we are at the point where we can actually take on major project and, and and that's an advantage because then we can start uh, uh putting more people together people they're not physicists they're not theorists people uh, like engineers that we can you know uh, uh, motivate them to join our experiment and and broaden our our community and that's important because then you have much more people that will support uh, the fundamental physics the fundamental projects that that we are talking about. So uh, we are at that point, and I think it's important for us to identify uh, uh, projects. So uh, like upgrade projects, we're also involved in the time of flight in a lease. We're, we're designing, or we're talking about designing the back end electronics of a lease, of a time of flight a lease. We just had a long meeting about designing the magnet, the, uh, the, the superconducting magnet with the people at CN Paint that you're gonna visit tomorrow. So there is this possibility to take on uh, uh, big, bigger projects, which would be very beneficial to Brazil because then we can bring in other people and one last point, if I may, uh, Brazil has another uh, uh, peculiar thing that there are two communities in Brazil, the nuclear physics community and the particle physics community. And for historical reasons, they're sort of separate, right? I think Tobias would agree with me. Uh, and, and so they're sort of like two networks. And this 
people here are mostly from the nuclear physics community. Very few people uh, talk in the two communities. I think Gaston is one of them. I, I don't know if Gaston is here, myself. So, uh, and on the experimental side, uh, the, the particle physics, the high energy particle physics community is actually even bigger because they have people in all experiments at the LHC and traditionally they had people at Fermilab and so on. So it is important somehow to also bring these opportunities, maybe Tobias won't like that, but to, to the particle physics community because there we also have many students, right? And, 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 and experimental students, so, you know, that, that they could contribute to the AIC. So that's the, the whole different community. We have a network called HENAFI, it's a federal network, and actually all participations of Brazilians in high energy, big collaborations, to some level, goes through and has to be discussed within HENAFI. So it will be very important to have uh, 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 um, a talk of the EIC with the HENAFI. Okay. Uh, it's called the leader is always from CBPF, Juva. But I'm a member of the CTC. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, and, and, you know, just to, to open up, because there is a large community, it's, it's a bigger community in high energy uh, for students on the experimental side, not on the theory side, but on the experimental side, certainly it's, it's a bigger community. So, it would be important to also, also do that. So, I'm very glad I didn't say anything because I think hearing that from you was very important. Many things that you said were absolutely true, and I'll give you some concrete examples of the expansion of the field beyond the known local centers to new institutions. You know, I grew up in India, and every time I grew up, there were comparisons made of various countries, and I would, India was always compared with Brazil. Except for the seven times more lo uh, population, a lot of things are common. And the transition that you just mentioned, beyond going set, you know, four or five centers for particle nuclear physics, there have been an expansion in colleges and universities, small universities, where a lot of the graduates of these big colleges have just settled down in the last five years or so. So when Elka mentioned EAC Asia, India is part of it, and there are about 20 institutions from India now, part of the EIC. They were all trained at either LHC or at RIC. They have never done deep elastic scattering, but they are a very important part of our activities in software development, in benchmarking various things, and they are making that transition. They want to build things locally, and we are talking about that, various, various things. And then they work closer uh, locally with the EIC Asia because that's easier for them to work with. So I think this system, you have to be patient. I can tell you, I've been going to India to convince people to get into EIC since 2004 or five. It's now happening because of the project it is happening, but people are taking notice. So you have the infrastructure already. You just have to see how to integrate that. Second comment I wanted to make was EIC was part of the US snow mass process. It was a significant part on detector R&D, the accelerator part, as well as some small avenues of physics connections. Now, people might say those are ambitious and you know, it might be very late in luminosity, you know, highest luminosity we can do it. But there are opportunities for students to get involved and start thinking about how to envision that and how to use for. So I think all of those points that you are, are, are happening now in some way or the other. And so you're not the first ones to experience that. But there are things that are, you can use and, and help each other, actually. Yeah. So no, I didn't have you had comments. <laughs> Anybody wants to add anything? Some more, more, more comments from Mexico. Unfortunately, we have only Mexico and Brazil. <laughs> but I just wanted to add to saying that in, in Mexico's situation is, is not very dissimilar either. And I uh, haven't talked a lot about Pakistan, but I'll probably have the chance to talk to you about, about uh, Pakistan and, 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 and China and India as well. That um, mm, for several years, some of the uh, institutions which were within Mexico City uh, 
had a more projection or link directly with with with, with U.S. institutions and, and and universities. But over the last twenty or thirty years, and on on there are so many provincial universities, Guanajuato, Guadalajara, Morelia, uh, San Luis Potosi, Colima, who have had uh, uh, yeah Leon, etc., Puebla, uh, even MCTP lately have uh, have contributed uh, an extremely good amount of work in terms of formation of students, researchers themselves writing physics reports uh, and doing uh, important work on the frontiers of physics. So having them also direct contact and direct links with the, with the American institutions uh, that you are promoting would be very beneficial for them. Yeah, I just want to add one comment, actually an advertisement. Uh, we have been talking about mostly sending people from here, from South America to the US and other institutions, but uh, there is also the other way. So we have uh, made some effort to internationalize our universities. Our major universities have uh, international offices who try to bring attract students from other places to spend a semester or a summer or even a year and they have funds for that and one big problem has been first um, to pay the travel it's always a barrier and also the language because not all the courses that are are, are given in in english but uh we are finding ways to overcome these this problems, these difficulties. And I think that um, we would benefit from help from this um, network in two ways. First, so sponsoring the, the travel, but most importantly, creating a link, sending students, not just like that to, you know, to, to, to follow any courses but to maybe be part of a local research group so they get uh, absorbed in this group and they are doing what we call internship so this would be uh, more ambitious to, than just an exchange student exchange program it would be like a exchange attached to research linked to research this is something that we have to think about can I say something about yeah, that? So, but, oh, I, sorry, I forgot to say, this is for undergraduate students. The For graduate students, this is already running, but that's... So Mexico, for some reason, is like a hub like to go to the US. There, there was many students want to come first to Mexico and then jump somewhere else. And so there, there is a Latin American uh, network that allows students to come to travel in Latin America. I guess Brazil is part of that one. I, I, I forgot the name, there are many of those. And so now in Mexico, we have a lot of students coming from uh, from uh, Peru because they have to do uh, this, this kind of uh, internship for the graduates. And there, there was a link, a student came, he was happy, and then many people came as well. And so that's something that happens uh, and it's working just just like, you know, students send the word that they had, they were well received in Mexico and they come and things like that. And also another thing about this uh, INNN grant, uh, the idea, if I understand, was to to have to go to the U.S. or to either uh, prepare for us to go. Um, yeah. And so, and so um, the project we had it was just in, in that um, in the theory list. So we went to the U.S. and also the student to, uh, from the U.S. came uh, to Mexico as well. So that was his first time uh, outside of the U.S. And I think it's it's really nice to have students coming outside and see that we have groups, we have strong universities and to show them that we, we do real science, right? Because they might have perhaps not prejudice, but they, they don't know. So it's just like they need to, to see that we have strong groups, we have good infrastructure, and we have uh, opportunities to offer as well. Yeah. I was just going to comment on that. So that kind of a support, we already had the money to do that, and the INN, and she used it, or a Mexican used it. I can imagine, easily that if we can identify uh, centers here which you know we probably can make a list of things that people are doing uh, just for this purpose and we can put that up on the INN and, and when we communicate with our 
American students who are looking for, my daughter came for six months to Honduras on a, on a school uh, uh, undergraduate student. And she found it out through her program and that's how she found it. We just have to advertise it more in the physics departments in the US that there are opportunities for students to go to South, South America and spend a summer or spend uh, six months working with scientists. And I think this can be done. This can be easily done. And it's not a lack of money for such things, even for undergraduates, that we will be able to do this. Uh, if I may um, make a comment and a suggestion. So I, I want to further strengthen Fernando's idea. And it's not only in students, even researchers. Like, uh, you know, for instance, to give you an example, Mike Lisa, the one from the 3C collaboration, he, he came for the first time here on a Fulbright uh, scholarship, right? Since then, you know, he, he, the, the impact that he had here, uh, uh, and, and we, he, it's my second master thesis student that we're publishing that Vortices stuff with Mike. So the, the impact is much bigger because he influenced much more people and, and helped. And obviously my student wants to go to Ohio State to, to, to pursue uh, a sandwich program for, for, for his PhD and so on. So if you could think of also researchers that would be willing to come here and spend some time, like, you know, not, not a week, but six months, uh, and to give seminars and to collaborate, it would be a much bigger impact. I mean, nowadays I can't get rid of Mike. Mike comes here every <laughs> six months or something. I can't get rid of the guy, but it's great, you know? No, and, and it's true. And as to your question, you need to identify the centers. There's one center you need to keep in mind. It's called Unicamp. The rest doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm kidding. But we can help you identify all these centers and all these people. The people are sitting here, right? So uh, that's that's right. And uh, but I think it would be very effective to have researchers come to Brazil and yes. spend some time here. I, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, knowing how Brazil is now, this is my first time to Brazil. I'm sure there are other people who would be very delighted to come here. No question about it. But what I want to say is that those one-year visits are already funded. There are pro procedures to do that. Uh, we don't know whether INNN, or through our system, I can tell you looking, knowing the finances, if, because they get paid you know, a significant fraction of a senior professor's salary when they go out for sabbaticals like this. I don't think we currently have it, but they want us to go for a very extended program. Maybe that becomes a future opportunity. But there, I, we need your help to say, if such a thing expands, then we would be willing to implement a program in any of the South. So we will need your help to get there, right? And the uh, programs like the uh, Ford Foundation and, and what you talked about, they already exist. And that they can, we can approach that. But, uh, but that if we can channel with yeah. the EIC, Absolutely. you know, it, yeah. it will it's be not, it, easier. Yeah, we, can do, we can include that. And it's yeah. easy to identify I people agree. like Raju, I'm sure, would yeah. be willing to come and spend right. some time right. with us, right? No, no, I think we can, we can certainly think about that, yes, absolutely. Uh, so what Fernando said is, is really important is that we, we talk about sending the students abroad, which is important for them, for their career, but also um, people from developed countries to come to uh, Latin America. It's also important to, so you can see what we have and, and that we are, we are not so bad, right? <laughs> so we, have, we, have, uh, we have good things to offer as well, just to see that it's not just in one direction. And so, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, first is about, we are in Sao Paulo State, so we are very fortunate. So we can ask for money for visitors up to one year. I mean, people that want to come in sabbatical. So this is something that maybe we have to explore in a more consistent way. You know, and many of us already have visitors for a couple of months up to one year. So we have, this is possible, okay, it's not, just to give you an idea, senior uh, person that comes here receives something around $4,000 per month 
that is enough for uh, for living. São Paulo, I don't know, but in Campinas or in São José, or <laughs> you see. So it, it, this is possible. Now I'm used, uh, Fernando also is used to that. Uh, no, Bruno also, I think, bring a visitor. So this is one thing, maybe to think in a coherent way. People that want to spend a summer in such a way that we have always someone working on with this kind of thing. This is just one observation. The other one that you mentioned that we have not discussed is the connection with strong 2020. I think many of us has collaborators in Europe and uh, we do not explore this. So maybe through EI and then see we could uh, explore more, no? So I, I, you just mentioned. Yeah, ju just a technical comment. Uh, unfortunately, this year we'll close. We have to leave by six o'clock. So maybe you want some final comments and maybe we can continue tomorrow at some point. No, I, I just want to make a short comment. There is already discussion to collaborate with Strong 2020 with the INNL. There is interest on both sides. We are interested. We were approached by them by after they saw what we are trying to do. So, but we don't know how that's going to go. But, but if you're part of it, if you're already discussion, you can help that conversation. 